almost ready to start. We're almost ready to start. Not quite yet. Almost there. Almost there. Are we ready? Can I do? I will do it now. Yep. One second. very very sorry I'm very 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 Canadian so I will say I'm sorry many 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 times we did have a plan and we didn't manage to make it to plan so we had to adapt and for those who have been here for the other sessions you'll know that we had to use our analog thinking we had to think sideways and come up with other routes and other plans so I gave you an assignment to do which is actually part of an activity later on today so that's already done so keep that handy We'll be coming back to that. Hopefully you've all finished your assignment. Smart technologies and shipping. Exactly. Excellent. So my name is Jillian Carson Jackson and I am Canadian Australian. Canadian first. I live in Australia now. I also lived in France. I worked for an organization called IALA for four years. Um, IALA. Anybody know IALA? Anyone who has it? Anyone who knows it here? Anyone who's here new today, what is Ayala? Anyone who's new here today? Ayala. I A L A. Who are they? Okay, I'll have to go to somebody who is here. No one's putting their hand up. Okay. No? Oh. Uh -huh. Somebody with your hand no one's putting their hand up to tell me what is Ayala? No one. Okay, I'm gonna to go to somebody who knows, I'm sure. Ayala? International Association of Marine Based to Navigable and Bikers Authorities. Did you get that? <laughs> okay. So that's Ayala. I used to work for Ayala. I lived in France for four years. And then I moved to Australia. And in Australia I worked on Lots of different types of technology that I had been working on previously, the automatic identification system, long-range identification and tracking, I think called e-navigation, and today we get to look at some of the future concepts of technology. We're getting smarter. Are we getting smarter? Okay, who's got a smartphone? Who's got a smartphone? Everybody? Who doesn't have a smartphone? Anybody not have some? Okay, who's got a, a Fitbit, a wearable, some sort of wearable, a watch, uh, something, anything? Oh, not as many as I thought, okay. So wearables are really popular in Australia. 
If you don't have a wearable, you're nothing. I don't have one. So I'm going to get one because I want to be somebody. No, my daughter has one and she says they're wonderful. So I have to keep track of my count of my steps. Um, and I, I might use that funny little thing in the corner there a bit today. We'll see how I go. My leg's been getting a bit sore. I have an injury on my leg. There's a big hole in it. I had a dog bite a while ago. Um, so every now and then I get tired and I might use it. Don't feel sorry for me. It's fine. I'm up and walking. I almost lost my leg, so this is way better. I can dance. So my name is Jillian. I'm here and I'm really honored to be able to present these sessions. Yesterday was a really intense day. Actually, every day has been intense. I am amazed and awed by your knowledge and by your energy, and I'm looking forward to today's session. I'm going to do very briefly my normal one, um, because I want to tell you about the Nautical Institute. Who here is a member of the Nautical Institute? We've got some new members now. Oh, 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 excellent. Good to see. The Nautical Institute. The Nautical Institute. You have to say the with a capital T. So when you say it, think of it as a capital T. So I don't know, does anybody know Anne of Green Gables? It's a very Canadian thing. You know, Anne of Green Gables was always Anne with an E. So as a little girl growing up, my name is Jillian Anne. I don't have an E. I was really mad at my mother for not giving me an E. But the Nautical Institute is a capital T. The Nautical Institute is an organization for maritime professionals. And yesterday we learned about what a professional is and what you need in order to be considered a profession. And one of those is that ability to have an entity or group that you share your knowledge. So education, this whole concept of continual professional development. And I have to say that IMU has been very forward looking in putting together this series under the GA. And the reason why I am late is because I was with Dr. Melanie Shankar for the morning session and then the breakfast. Now, do you know Dr. Shankar? Yes, I think it's hard not to. So, you don't say no to her. And it was well done. It was a great trip. I have some pictures, though, because it fits right in with today's session. Because we are on what's going to be one of the coolest transportation systems you've got ever. 78 electric metro, water metro. Boat. It's going to be amazing. And just think of all the great fun. Anyway. So, the Nautical Institute. Benefits of membership. All sorts of stuff you get, continuing professional development, some online free training, access to training at reduced rates and all the publications, those great magazines called Seaways. The free membership gives you an electronic version of these. Great. And there's also the navigator. I somehow lost mine somewhere. I've left them out. I don't know where it's gone. Oh well. And it's all free for you as students. That's the best thing. What do you get for free, eh? Uh, it's your first degree, I think. I'm not sure if it's free for your second degree, but if you're a student, you can apply for the free membership. It's pretty straightforward. I think there's a couple of clicks. Someone said they did it just the other day. Click through, there you got it. If you have any questions about the NI, ask Captain Libby. <laughs> ask me or him or anyone in the Nautical Institute, because there's a lot of us. And I am the past president of the Nautical Institute, and I will say it because I just love to say it because it was just an amazing event. And when I put my foot on the path for the Nautical Institute in 2012, when I got my fellowship, it took 10 years to get there. Well, eight years. They never had a female president. So I was the first female president of the Nautical Institute. Women in Maritime! Woo! Okay. Enough of that. Ground rules. You can read all those, although you can't read them in the back. It's really hard to read back there. So the ground rules. You all have something to contribute. Please contribute. You will be asked to contribute. You will be by table even asked to contribute. Take the mic, speak up, speak clearly, and share your thoughts. That's really important. The only stupid question or bad suggestion is the one that isn't asked. So please bring them forward. If you have a question that we can't talk about at that time because it's not on topic or it's going to take too long, put it aside, bring it forward, and keep it for the open mic. Even though we have a short session, I'm going to do an open mic session at the end. And that's when you ask me anything about the topic of the day. There are some things I will talk about. 
speak in turn, respect the person talking, and that brings me to practicing active listening. I've come back here for a reason because I want to know what you guys think of active listening. So I know some of you guys who've been here before, you know what it is. What's active listening? How do you actively listen? How do you actively listen? Oh. Yes, nodding in body language. I was here before. <laughs> How do you active listening? So you do a nodding body language. How else do you actively listen? Right? Through your ears? Yes, it comes in through your ears. And where does it go? Into your brain. You think about it. So think about what I'm saying. Your brains think a lot faster than I talk. Thank goodness. If I could talk as fast as your brains, you wouldn't understand a word I'd say. Probably pretty bad already. That Canadian accent. I know. So when you hear something, you think about it, you do what then to confirm what I've said? Anything? What do you do when you hear it, you think about it? How do you know it's what I've said? What's that? Hmm? You process it in your own mind, and then what do you do if you have any questions about it? You ask a question, you confirm, you get feedback. Go back to the other one. There's no stupid questions or bad suggestions. Please think about it. What else can you do for active listening? Anybody here? Take notes. He's been here before. <laughs> he was here yesterday. You take notes. You keep track of it all. You try to make sense of it because active listening is one of the most important skills you will have throughout your entire life. Active listening is an important skill throughout your whole life. That's a very orange bottle. <laughs> You're going to find I'm also really, the next one there, which is respecting the person. Speak in turn, the one before that. Respect the person talking. I am very much into that. If someone's speaking, they're speaking for a reason. You should be listening to them. And when you speak, you should expect them to listen to you. Because active listening is actually a two-way street. If someone's speaking and I'm not listening, that means I'm not actively listening. If I'm on my phone, if I'm talking to somebody else, try and make sure you keep that up. I do have a method for this. I do it with all my kids. My kids are old now. I put my hand up. I put my finger to my lips. So if I do that, and you see my arm up and you can hear someone talking, tell them to be quiet because it's important. You will have a lot of great ideas to share, and I want to hear them, but I can't hear them if there's a lot of noise. Stay focused, respect time. I'm really bad at that. May I go I feel so bad about this because your time is precious, and I feel that I've let you down. I will do my very best to make sure that that doesn't happen again, and I will also respect your time so that we have time for a quick break. But because of the late start, I'm gonna give you, say, five minutes, grab your tea and come back if you could. That means we can keep on topic. If you need to get up and go powder your nose or something, please just do that. But for the break, the official break, this morning's break is gonna be pretty short because we're late to start. Um, mobiles on silent. Actually, the respect to one. I'll give you time to come back. I usually say come back two minutes before that, but if you're only going to get five minutes, that's really not fair. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, but definitely get back in five minutes when we go for break. Mobile's on silent. If it rings, I want you to port. Well, how much should it be today, guys? 500 Australian dollars? 500 rupees? It was 200 rupees yesterday. The first day, I think Captain Vidav said, 200 or five, yeah, yeah, 500 Australian dollars. I thought that was a bit much. Um, if your mobile rings and I hear it, 200 rupees to the mission to seafarers. Okay? Got it? And I'll be looking. I got somebody over there yesterday. And they weren't even part of the group. Internet use workshop related. Yes, you will need to use the internet. No, do not look at Facebook. You don't look at Facebook. That's an old person's one. Do not look at Instagram. Do not look at whatever else. But use your internet when required, like this morning's activity. And in Anchorage area, that's those questions. If you have a question and I can't answer it then, 
write it down, either bring it forward, or keep it in mind so that when we get to the open mic, we can get to your question. And we had some really good discussion, very philosophical discussions yesterday about nature and nurture and computers and people and whether or not we're actually programmed just like a computer. So the big questions come out then. Yeah, they're really easy to answer once. Uh, we may never answer them, but at least we can have a chance to talk about them. Okay, so today, we're getting smarter. Smart port, smart navigation. We're going to get into that initially. Then we're going to talk about humans and machines. I started a little bit of this on Tuesday, but we're going to get into humans and machines and where we're moving. And I have a picture I took. We were in traffic. Imagine that. We were stopped by this really cool poster. So hopefully I can grab it and put it in during our short break. Learning and working in the digital world, that's you. And we're going to think about how do we learn and work in a digital world, and then we move into the open mic. Now, the session I had planned on maritime informatics is the one I've had to drop because the alumni, I mean, the uh, faculty, Dr. Shankar asked that I present to the faculty, and the only time we could do that will be today. So I will have an hour and a half session with all of your faculty um, here and also online. So apologies. Maritime informatics is really, really cool. Talk to me about maritime informatics. I'd like to follow up on that sometime, but that's the one session we had to drop. Maritime communications through the decades. Oh, does anybody remember a great quote from yesterday? George Bernard Shaw. Does anybody remember the quote from yesterday? I don't have it up there today, but anybody remember it? About communication. The problem with communication. What's that? What's that? The illusion that has taken place. So, uh, is a, a playwright whose name's George Bernard Shaw. My husband does a lot of amateur theater, so I have a lot of amateur theater references. George Bernard Shaw, he said that the problem with communication is the illusion it has taken place. So we communicate, but does anybody actually hear? Do they understand? Did they actively listen? Did they think about what was being said? Were they able to make sense of what you said? Did they do feedback after what you said? So active listening comes into that. So maritime communication through the ages has all been about how do we communicate? How do we communicate? How do we communicate? So we talk to each other, we share our thoughts, we communicate. How do we communicate at sea? How do I talk to you when I'm in the middle of the Indian Ocean? How do I communicate? How do I communicate with a ship who doesn't speak my language? I hope you are actively listening. Okay, so when I'm talking, nobody else talks, right? Isn't that right? When I talk, nobody else talks. When you talk, I don't talk. So how do we communicate in various ways? So maritime communication through the decades. Let's go back a few years, <laughs> a long, long, long time ago. You see someone's doing semaphore. <laughs> we got that? That's how you used to communicate. You used to communicate with flags, we still do. We still have flags on ships. We use flags to communicate. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, please. SMCP. Yes, that's it. Do you know what it stands for? Marine communication phrases. Okay, I'm really happy. Standard marine communication phrases were the best things that ever came out of one of the communication issues. Unfortunately, it. Okay, the maritime industry is really good at being reactive. The Titanic happened. The iceberg happened. We got solace. 
the Troy Canyon happened, there was a lot of pollution. We got the log hole. 9-11 towers got crashed down and we got ISPS for security. So we're really good at being reactive. If you read any, pretty much any incident report about shipping, communication will come up. So communication is a huge issue. I, I teach SMCP to my VTS operators who speak English. So I teach SMCP to English speakers because it's not English. It is a standard marine communication phrases. And that means English speakers need to learn it. The best thing about that, message markers. Put your mouth Question. Answer. Information. Request. Warning. Advice. They are fantastic. They really focus your mind. So actually, I tend to use them when I teach as well. So that's the, at the beginning, we had all sorts of a mess of communications not really working too well. So then we came into, probably about a decade ago, we started getting into computers, into computing, maybe two decades ago. And we've got lots of ways to communicate, but multiple times. So how many times have you, maybe you don't, but when email first came, we sent an email and I'd give him a call and say, did you get my email? Do you guys ever do that? Did you get my Did you get my message? I sent you a message. Did you get my message? So, so we have these multiple ways of communicating, and you would have to, when you came into a port, send information to the port office, information to the customs office, information to the vessel traffic services, the same information in a different manner to all these different people in the same country to go into the same port. So it's not really very efficient. We're working on it. Okay, so then what happens? Well, we have a way to organize it all. We have big data, big data analytics. We have ways to share data through funneling all of this information into one area and then sharing out. The information goes in once, it goes out many, many, many times to meet the different purposes. So we're working that way in maritime communications and that's getting smarter. It's getting better. I don't want to steal the thunder. Some of you might have found some smart technologies that are coming around that. So maritime communication and information exchange, sharing of information, it's developing. And I did this a few years ago, and I was really pleased that I put a drone in because they've become even more important since I put this together. Now, if you take a look, and you probably can't see from the back, but we've got fishermen, we've got search and rescue, we've got authorities, management, maritime management, uh, we have geographic areas, we have military, all that information going out to the right people who have the right authority for that information. And it's built on these pillars. Now those pillars I'll read out because you can't read them from there, but those pillars are linked as well to e-navigation pillars. So you've got the technology pillar which means we need the technology to make it work. You've got the policy pillar. Policy is really important. Reading regulations, the laws, the acts, they're there for a reason. And every single word in those policies that you have has been really well thought about. So policies are really good. Now what are the pillars? Can't read it myself. Was it strategy? Oh, thank you, strategy. Yes, I love that. <laughs> I did write it. Uh, the strategy. So you've got your vision for the future. That strategy is a pillar for your maritime exchange, your data exchange. Now, strategy has actually led us to the point that we're doing digital data exchange formats internationally that can use any kind of equipment. And they're called the S100 series. If you're really interested, talk to somebody who's done the S100 series already. We talked about that. Then you've got competence. Sorry, kind of governance. Then we've got governance so that people will have the oversight and ensure that it's implemented in a fair and equitable manner. And finally, you have your systems. Now, systems mean that communication is not one. I don't just use my telephone. I don't just use an email. 
I don't just use anyone. I have re reliable, robust, and redundant communications methodologies. So let's go through this. Reliable, robust, and redundant. Reliable means they work. Pretty straight time. Robust. What is robust? What's something? What's, what's robust? Anybody? Robust. It's a word, isn't it? Okay, what does it mean? Do you want to look it up? You can look it up if you want. Robust. Okay, somebody's got something here. Ah, one second. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm not as quick as I was yesterday. It's strong. It means strong. That's a great way to put it. It's robust. Robust means strong. It means it's available. It's there. It is not flimsy, I guess, if you want to go the other way. Flimsy would be sort of a, an opposite of robust. So you've got reliable, robust, and redundant, which means you've got multiple systems. And we were talking about position, navigation, and timing in one of the other ones. And one of the things that's come out is that we need to have redundant terrestrial backup for GNSS. Okay, GNSS. What's GNSS? Anybody? I'm not going to do more. Somebody hasn't spoken before. <laughs> okay, GNSS? Global, Global Navigation Satellite System. Thank you. They must have heard you. Sorry. <laughs> so we have robust, reliable, and redundant communication networks in order for us to move forward into an information management rather than an information explosion. So we did go through that. But now we're managing it, and we're getting smarter about how we do that. Now I have to keep my phone out. Okay. So we are getting smarter. Smart technology is defined as a technology which uses big data analytics. It uses machine learning and artificial intelligence. We're going to get into that to provide cognitive awareness to objects which would normally be static, would not normally be there. So it gives you cognitive awareness. We're going to talk a bit about what does it mean to be cognitively aware. So your brain, we have a brain, so we're aware of things, but now we're getting technology to be aware of other technology. So I arrived in South Korea a number of years ago for a workshop with IELA, which is the International Association of Marine Aids and Navigation and Lighthouse Authorities. And I arrived in South Korea, the Republic of Korea, apologies, I use the right name. I arrived in the Republic of Korea, and I was sitting at a table with all of the other people from all over the world at a meeting, and all of our phones went off immediately. There was a tsunami warning. And a part of the warning system, my phone was so smart that it was cognitively aware of the fact that it was in South Korea within the geographic range and polygon area that I should get that alert. That's pretty cool. That's pretty smart. And every phone from all over the world got that same alert at exactly the same time. And that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty smart. That's cognitively aware. So that's a smart tool. Now imagine a ship. I'm on a ship and I'm steaming in and the starboard hand lateral boy that I'm supposed to see, that's, that's something we kind of do out here, the starboard hand lateral boy is off position. And I see it way over there and I'm like, oh, I should go over there. Oh, but my system already tells me on my actus that board is off position. It really should be here, so just keep going. So that's cognitively aware. So as we get into smarter systems, the ships, the tools, the shore infrastructure, everything, and, and it's coming through all aviation, smart cities, smart ports, smart cars. Oh, not those tiny little ones. They used that word before they were smart. So there are many definitions in a similar concept. I was going to have you research this, but I think we don't have time. No, so I'm going to give this to you. Smart. What does smart stand for? This is a different, this is a trick question. Is smart like as an object? It's not a smart objective. They've got another name. So they became smart because it's self monitoring, analysis, and reporting technology. So we've forgotten that 
because we use it so much. Self-monitoring, analysis and reporting technology. That's what smart technology is. When you think about it, it's exactly what it's doing. My telephone. My telephone was self-monitoring that I was in Fuzen. It did an analysis of the area, of all of the networks, all of the information that was there. It was constantly looking at it and reporting back on it. And then the technology gave me an alert. So it's smart. But that's where smart comes from. So we use smart all the time. But it came from self-monitoring, analysis, and reporting technology. And it means we connect objects. Pretty much any object. So those who did have a wearable, who has a wearable? You have a wearable. Okay, do you have it connected to anything? Phone. How hard was it to connect to your phone? One click. Yeah, pretty cool, eh? So we have different objects connecting to each other. Does anybody, you're probably all too young. My uncle has an incredible thing. He loves technology. He got an iPhone. He got these cool bulbs in his house. And he turned on the lights from the restaurant so the lights were on at the house when we got home. It's so cool. Or you can close your garage door from somewhere else because you've got this internet of things going through the garage with these technologies that are coming. Pretty practical. What's that? Smart home. Yes. Does anybody have a smart home? Do you really? Tell me what's smart about it. Like uh, everything is connected to the internet, so like when we are out, so we just click, uh, we just speak on the phone or Alexa that turn on the AC at this temperature, so it gets turned on. That's so cool. I watched, I watched a movie called, I think it was called Meet the Parents or something that was, anyways, the whole house was interconnected with Alexa and you sit down and it sounded like the like the girl from Big Bang Theory, anyways, they had put the voice on it. So it was a really cool movie. I wasn't really aware that all of the houses could do that. That was so neat. So smart technology, it's an interconnection of objects. Okay, we've got multiple objects connected. What are we getting to? To the internet. We've got lots of things connected to the internet. What would that be called? Internet of things, yeah. Everything's pretty straightforward. So we have things connected to the internet and they call it the internet of things. So smart technologies, communications, it brings us to the internet of things. And that just means that all these cool bits and pieces are connected to the internet. So sensors, databases, wireless access to be collaboratively sensitive, sorry, to go to collaboratively sense, adapt and provide for users. So they work together and they say what they think you want to know. Sometimes on Facebook, so this is probably why you should do Facebook. On Facebook, I'm here in India. I'm getting advertisements for things here in India when I go on Facebook. I have LinkedIn, I've got lots of Indian contacts. On Facebook, I don't think I have any who live in India. I, I apologize, I do. I have, I have a, the very first ever female pilot in India, Reshma. The loafer, fantastic woman, so pretty exciting. Um, yes, yeah, she's on my Facebook, but it's within the environment. And then using big data analysis and machine learning and artificial intelligence, it provides this cognitive awareness. Remember I talked about cognitive awareness. This is where we're going. Cognitive awareness to the objects that were in past considered inanimate. Now, okay, we're not making my light bulb walk, but we are making my light bulb do something. So it's becoming animate. But it's not like animation. It's not like anime. Um, it is taking that and making it do something, even from a distance. So that's what smart is. Probably more than you. You just use it. It's a bit like a car. You don't necessarily need to know how it works. You just need to how, how you can use it. So you want to simplify smart. You've got Internet of Things. IoT devices, networked, sensors, online. In the future, actually the future is now, scalable, automated, autonomous ships. We're going to talk about those on Saturday. Well, that's tomorrow now, isn't it? 
no cost to tell us about my class. Um, smart connected devices, just like your, your wearables and your phones. Customized experience. They do require interaction, so you do things with them. And then you've got smart devices with limited automation. They don't even need the internet to connect. And there's a really cool technology that is being trialed now. And we talked a little bit about it the other day. I'm not going to go into detail, but it's actually using, from a ship's point of view, the waves of the metal to transfer data without using radio waves. So it's metal surface wave transmission. Really, really cool, really new. It's being trialed and it's being presented by China in a working group that I lead. So it's very exciting. Stand by, let you know if it works. <laughs> they say it does. I haven't seen it work. So smart, when you simplify smart, internet of things, smart connected devices and smart device, smart um, devices on their own, not connected. Now I do want to do this, but let's, I know what we can do. Talk about adapting. Okay, I have an activity I want you to do. This one I do want you to do. But we can do it during coffee break. That means you're going to get the whole 15 minutes for, cup, for tea break, but you're going to bring your tea back here and talk during that break, okay? And I will give you overall 15, 19 minutes, almost 20 minutes. So in your table groups, I want you to identify at least three applications or possible applications for smart technologies in the maritime industry. I want you to think of an application for IoT devices, smart connected devices, and smart devices. Now, if you want to remember what they were, I'll pop that up. You can take a picture of that because you're smart on your smartphones. And then you will always remember what that is. At least one person from each table. Just grab a quick photograph of that. And I want you to think in the maritime industry how you can use smart technology. I don't need to new, I don't I don't need the research yet. We'll come back to what you've researched later. Okay, and we got the picture? Good. I'll leave that one up. Oh you want it? Oh sorry, did you get it? Do you need to go I've done it again. Do you need to get it? You're, okay, I'm good. Okay, good. So in your table groups, and I will give you with coffee break until 11.15. Yeah, I give you till 11.15. Until 11.15 to do this, this activity. Um, I will say, I'm not sure, do you, do you celebrate Remembrance Day? I should have asked that. But today is November 11th. So the 11th hour, 11th minute of the 11th hour of the 11th day has been set aside for Remembrance. So. That's going to come during the break. Take a few seconds just to remember everyone who's died during the world wars so that we can be free and have this amazing lifestyle that we do now. Okay. So in your smart in your groups, three applications, go grab a cup of tea, have a quick break, come back, and we'll take this up at 11.15. We'll start discussing it at 11.15. Actually, I've talked a bit too long. So we'll do it at 11.18. I do have a video. <laughs>
Mm. I don't see that he sent it. Mm. Okay, he says he sent it. I don't see it. Maybe he mailed it. Hey. Mm. Really? Mm. Send.
Yes. So, there's a type of service you use sensors that you come in, so the information decision so GPS, so GPS, so GPS, no, on its own, well, it's a single sensor, so GPS feed is uh, the GPS feed, it can be an IoT, the GPS uses the GNSS, it uses a rudder in the so be considered um, an IoT device? Yeah. Yeah, so not GPS, but GPS on its own is one size. When you're looking at smart, you're looking at multiple things, like the GPS itself. So it's actually a very stupid thing. But you can vary it with other systems. We'll give a time. Okay, I hope you guys are almost ready. I hope the tables are pretty light on. So get your discussion going. We're going to be taking it up in two minutes. We're going to ask what you come up with in two minutes. Okay, everybody. So I'm going to go to each table and I want you to give me one of the three that you found. So hopefully you found at least three applications of this concept of smart technology in the maritime environment. And I want you to give me one per table. Now it might be that we start duplicating. So I'm going to start at the back and work my way forward. <laughs> I'm going to start at the back and work my way forward. Okay, we're going to start taking this up now. Also, those who are coming back now could be a little bit rushed trying to find the answer, but there we go. Hopefully you did it already. Okay, I'll start with you guys. One smart technology. I'm sure you got at least one by now. Who wants to speak? You? Good morning all. So the smart innovation of item field which we called as Lodicator. I think this this has been in earlier uh, sections. We have talked about Lodicator. So Lodicator is a software, a computer software which was built in order to make uh, the 
cargo operation is much easier for uh, the crew members. Uh, using a load indicator, we can calculate the uh, different stresses, the mending movements that is associated with uh, the hour sheet. It is also gives us the ballast amount, stability criteria. So, in one word, we can say that uh, the calculation a chief mate would have done in 10 to 15 hours can be done in two to uh, 10 to 15 minutes now. Just we have to give the inputs, the dynamic and static information of the ship should be given to the software. It will uh, give all the necessary criteria, stability criteria. So, this is one of the a very useful innovation that Matem has seen in the last decade. Thank you. Thank you. And that was called e-locator. What was the name of that again? Lodicator. So it gives you that opportunity to take multiple sensors in, and it does what a machine does well, which is repeatable calculations and providing you with information. So well done. This table's next. Who's speaking? The technology uh, we have discussed, discussed is a uh, smart propulsion system and uh, that one uh, we included is electromagnetic ship propulsion uh, using electromagnetic uh, electromagnetic forces thrust for propulsion. Thank you very much. And a really important use of technology it will also help, I think, make it more efficient and greener. So we got lots of benefits. Okay, who's speaking? He doesn't want to speak, I can see. There you go, you get it. Renson, is it? Yeah, Renson, there you go. IoT devices, application bridge equipment and manoring system increase engine efficiency, reduce the frequency of breakdown. Okay, which one did you use again? IoT devices, so that was the bridge, bridge equipment and manning systems. Yes, so IoT, excuse me, I'm talking. IoT can be used in integrated navigation and bridge systems, so there's a lot happening there. This clip is next, and you're busy writing. I only need one. I'm sure you've got at least one. Okay, who wants to speak? Okay. So smart maneuvering autonomous control with the sensors coming, multiple sensors coming in for IoT and then supporting maneuvering. Next one. IoT devices like underneath sensor enable continuous monitoring of the condition of machinery and other equipment. And in terms of predicting maintenance and IoT in monitoring and tracking of ships. Okay, we got lots there. It's wonderful. We'll clap first. It's, it's amazing what the technology is giving us for being able to track different aspects of the ship. Um, we're actually sensing how a shaft is moving, and as soon as it seems to vibrate the teeniest bit, that information is being sent so that you can actually put it into your maintenance schedule, and you can fix it before it breaks down. When I went to sea, it just broke down. This is much better. Okay, over here. Okay, integrated control system. The system uses smart technology that connects the parts of the ship to a central server. This can include propulsion, maneuvering controls, and communication that are managed by individual units. Well done. And another one here. So I'll be talking about a wearable device, which is ZS Wellness. So it's created for uh, tracking health systems of the crew members while on board. So working at sea for long periods of time can be detrimental for work, for health. A combination of long working hours for diet and lack of exercise increases the chance of major health incidents such as heart attack and other diseases. 
So this wearable device is used to keep track of all health diseases and everything. So it's an IoT device. That's all right. <laughs> And what a wonderful opportunity to be able to keep track of the health, the how your heart's doing, how your heart rate's doing, your, your intake, your sleep, fatigue. We talked about fatigue earlier um, in one of the days. <laughs> it's important to manage your sleep and fatigue. Uh, next. Morning, everyone. So we are going to talk about boards that use digital twin technology. They are automated boards using new technologies while caring more for the marine environment and there are smart ports, uh, techn smart port technologies that include big data, AI, internet of things, blockchain technology and 5G connections. Digital twin technology is helping ports to achieve business efficiency and protect our mar maritime ecosystem. And I'm not going to talk much about, uh, yeah, remember digital twins, I want to come back to them. There's lots of digital twins out there, and they're doing a lot of great work. Uh, who's talking from here? <laughs> Morning. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, digital cargo optimization. Uh, by, by using this technology, we can reduce uh, 15 to 20 percent of empty cargo spaces uh, by load uh, containers and other cargoes. And just imagine how that does on the bottom line of a company. So they were having empty areas and now they're going to have it all filled with cargo, which gives them more money, which makes more sense. So they're going to get smarter. That's what we hope. Okay, next. Good morning to everyone. And the topic uh, is technology for shipping industry. The main one is artificial intelligence. And it can be included road and fuel optimization, autonomous navigation, and it can be reduced the maintenance cost. Yeah, we're getting very smart here. Okay, next. Who's speaking? Oh, well, I'd like somebody other than someone who hasn't spoken. So, uh, the um, big data analysis is what I select, or what our team selected. Uh, data that it takes hinges upon the mining collection, and inferences are drawn from large stock piles of information that uh, come from large operation environments uh, such as ship and boat. Now we have digital twins, we've got big data, big data feeds the digital twins. So they're all actually interconnected. Who's next over here? Good morning everyone. Uh, we'll be talking about documented reality. And uh, augmented reality can be used in terms of uh, in training seafarers, and many of the maritime universities are implementing it so that we it can be used without going in real time ships. Which, as the prices are increasing day by day, I think this is a great opportunity for the students as they train in augmented reality. And the next thing is ship building and uh, design process efficiency by using augmented reality. I think it is uh, more if we can efficiently design. Well, through our visions, we'd be able to uh, put in more if, like visions, and that they, even if there are uh, errors, I think we'll be able to uh, like make it right through augmented reality. And uh, with next thing is also is onboard ships can allow like we this can reduce human errors by predicting the next move or next phase of navigation. I just want to slide on augmented reality a little bit later. It's really cool. Okay, over here. Someone else. Sorry. Uh, but when we are done, as we discussed, so we come to this uh, blockchain, uh, blockchain analysis. As uh, it is uh, provide transparency, security, and cost reduction in finance. Uh, as it provides, as, as it provides transparency, security, and cost reduction in finance transactions. I think you have more there too, but blockchain is an amazing, it's more than just finance, it's more than Bitcoin. Blockchain is a security protocol that uses hashing. I had more time, we could have a little hashing game, but um, we won't have time for that. Here you go. So we did speak about so many technologies, including artificial intelligence, blockchain technology, and so many other things. And we do have smartwatches, smart mobiles, and smarter cities. 
but i promise by taking inputs from all your sources we'll be making smarter ships along and uh, i also like to mention we got we found this auto autonomous fire fighting robots <laughs> so it helps us in a way that it mitigates and also controls fire on board which is a severe cause or like which is a main reason why damage of life and also the cargo takes place on vessel which is a major, major reason why it happens it's time is fire fighting robots is fantastic now what about autonomous tank inspection so nobody has to go into an enclosed space? Um, we just had a competition in the Nautical Institute on entry into confined spaces. People still die. We know we shouldn't do it. Someone goes in, you can't get hold of them. Don't go in after them. <laughs> Make sure you have a, a breathing apparatus or something. What can we do? We've got firefighting robots. We can get tank inspection robots. I was at a restaurant in Canada. And my food was delivered by a robot. It was a really cute cat face. It was really fun. Um, so IoT and, and smart technologies all around. Who's speaking here? Okay. Good morning. Like uh, everyone has found one or two technologies. We have found different types of four technologies. So first we have RFID, which is a radio frequency identification device, which helps us to track the pack, uh, track the cargoes and everything, the passage of it and the other one is predictive maintenance. It is a machine learning model. It compares the current data to the similar data and we get to know how it's going to go. That's fantastic. I'm sorry, you could go on and on. There's so much RFID technology. We saw, oh, there's a, a bee here, so I hope no one's allergic. He's flying around. Then he's moved back that way. All the, all the sweet people are back there. The RFID technology, the uh, smart containers, you probably heard of smart containers, and we also have smart life jackets, that whole concept about locating and being able to keep track of them all. There you go. Who's speaking? Good morning to all. An example of IoT devices is AIS. It stands for Automatic Identification System. What it does is, uh, it is an automated tracking system that displays other vessels in the vicinity. And I take them from GPS, GPS. and uh, what are angle indicator on the ship. Okay. So from the point of, yes, we'll clap you. We're going to call that a good thing. So AIS is a bit of an old technology. We may not think of it as a smart technology but it is a digital technology that integrates different sensors. So it fits that definition of an IoT technology. GPS input, rudder angle indicator input, rudder angle indicator input. So you've got input from different digital devices into the AIS. Yes, it's an old technology, it's been around a long time, but it also does fit one of the first steps of this definition of an IoT. Okay, although it's not always through the internet. It was wired to begin with. But things are getting better. Who's speaking here? I shouldn't let you speak before. Come on everyone. Morning, everyone. So we got a three for each. So for IoT thing, technical operation of a vessel, like we can introduce a program management system for EXA and SEMB management. And the second one is that turning a vessel into a smart vessel, we can introduce a API like for the the faster data transformation between the BTMS and the EIS. And the third one is like advanced integrated storage system for the alternative fuels, the introduction of the advanced AI sensors with the exposing meters like advanced one for uh, alternative fuel storage systems. And uh, the smart connected devices is that smart propulsion systems and the uh, integration of the VTS and the EIS and satellites for the better PMT. And the uh, third one is the EPS, the e, like person at work addressing system with advanced UI and UX and the last one is smart devices in that like we discussed is 100 degrees and the EI bear engineering and hybrid moving systems. Thank you. Okay, I've got all of those. Woo! There's no time. Um, hybrid moving systems, I'm going to pull on that one right now. Really interesting warning systems that are available. You can see autonomous vessels autonomously going alongside and mooring autonomously everything. So no lines, there's different ways, um, the suction is magnetic, there's lots of development in this area. 
And just imagine not having a line snap and possibly kill somebody. It's lots of opportunities to use technologies in a smart manner. Okay, you guys have done an amazing job, and I think lunch is at 12.15, is that right? 12.45, 12.45. Okay, so we're doing really well. Data sharing for smart port environments, and that's where we got into some smart ships. Um, a bit about digital ports, digital twins. So what's a digital twin? What, what do you think a digital twin is? Anybody? What do you think a digital twin is? Uh, replicating the uh, same set of digital systems, like between two bodies. Yes, it is, and it's a twin. So it's not actually between two bodies, it's, it's like having a duplicate of the port in the virtual world. So a digital twin, you have digital twins for cities, so cities can be digitally twinned, and they can look and identify, well, if we were going to put an overpass here, what would it do to all the other traffic? So before they do it, they do the digital twin. A port, they can take a look at a port and they say, I want to bring in LPG. I think there's LPG coming in too. Oh, We've got LNG, now they're going to bring in something else. Where is it going to go? How is it going to work? They can twin it, and then as in a simulation, so you can actually have digital twins. You can also use digital twins on a ship to monitor their systems. Make it into simulations to be building safer ships. So digital twins are kind of cool. So, data sharing for smart port environments includes this concept of developing a digital twin, but it also is looking through that to optimize and coordinate your port operations. What happens when a ship comes into port? Who's a management trainee here? What happens when a ship comes into port? What do they need to do from a ship management point of view? Anybody? Loading and unloading cargo. In order to load and unload a cargo, what do they need to do? They need to know what their cargo is. They need to know what cargo they have, a bill of lading. They need to get customs clearances. They need to, they need to get rid of their garbage. They need to get their stores. They need to get their fresh water. They need to have a tug to help them bring in. They need to have a pilot to come in. They need to have people on the board to take the lines because they don't all have these automatic birthing systems yet. So you've got a whole pile of people involved in bringing a ship alongside. And that takes a lot of coordination. So smart ports can make use of smart technologies, the IoT, all of the smart information we've got, to make it more efficient for a vessel to come in. It can be used for real-time navigation, power, logistics, the digital twinning we talked about, and autonomous, ultimately, autonomous operations. Well, actually, I shouldn't say ultimately. There are autonomous operations right now. Um, so autonomous does not mean uncrewed. Autonomous means something's happening automatically. And we just heard about it, the automatic identification system. We have had autonomous systems on a ship ever since we had a, I think how far back would we go? I guess, yeah, ever since an autopilot, yeah. And when did autopilot come in, those who were here for the first day? 1909, actually. It was 1909, wasn't it? Yeah, 1909 in aviation, we had autopilot. So don't be scared by autonomous. The word autonomous is a really, some people go, oh my gosh, autonomous ships are coming and have no job. Uh -uh -uh. Autonomous ships are coming, autonomous ships are here. We have autonomy on ships right now. We have autonomy in our cars, we have autonomy in our houses, and we aren't out of jobs yet. The jobs will be changing, and we need to look at what that means. So, autonomous ships, autonomous operations. And some really cool stuff that I saw today. So, fresh, fresh from this morning, I'm using my light. Think blue, go green. You have some incredible tools and technology coming right here to Kochi soon. There's five delivered. There's going to be 78 overall. And I think you're going to have nine ships by the end of this, this calendar year. It is a electric ferry system. That's the charging port. That's the entrance area. 
And this is the bridge. I've got lots of ships, pictures of the bridge. There's so much cool technology there. But you're looking at integrating different technologies for a green future. And that is really neat. So I had to pop that up because it was just so cool. And I'm not in any of those pictures, but I was there. I do want to show a video. So I'm hoping for my tech people that the video is going to work. I plugged it in. I want to show you a video. It's a little bit old. Well, I consider it old. It's based on technology, well, system of studies, projects that started a long time ago. It was called the Mona Lisa Project. Has anybody heard of the Mona Lisa Project? There's Mona Lisa 1, Mona Lisa 2, Efficiency 1, Efficiency 2, Sea Traffic Management, and Sea Traffic Management uh, Demonstrator. Yes. Yes, long before S100. Long before S100. Yeah. So Mona Lisa, 2000 and, well, I've gotten involved in about 2009 in the Mona Lisa project. It's wrapped up now. So Mona Lisa 1, Mona Lisa 2, Efficiency 1, Efficiency 2 and the sea traffic management demonstrator are all done. So this is a video that came out in 2018, so it's four years old. And that's actually, believe it or not, before a lot of S100. S100 was an app, just a little gleam in someone's eye back then. But it does demonstrate some of the work that's happened, and it was updated to the outcomes of all the trials that they did. What's wonderful about the Mona Lisa projects all the way through they were driven by pilots. So they had, in Sweden, there were some pilots that had a very futuristic vision and the government supported it. And in the EU, they put a lot of money behind this project. So I'm gonna show a short video about sea traffic management. One second. Okay, that's how it works. Nope, no sound. Can we check our sound? Put it up here. It's up there. There it is. When thousands of ships oh, carry millions of tons of cargo, small decisions easily have great consequences. Uncoordinated data between ships and ports is synonymous with monetary loss when vessels are delayed, fuel burned, and suboptimal routes are chosen. We are changing that. I'm just going to put on the closed captions that might help. What if we were to develop a solution that radically increased the coordination of information among ships, ports, and shipping companies? What if personnel on board and on shore could base decisions on real-time information? Sea traffic management and leading industry partners have developed tomorrow's digital infrastructure for shipping. Through data exchange among selected parties such as ships, service providers and shipping companies, we are creating a new paradigm for maritime information sharing. MS Validator is just about to begin 13 days journey from New York to Umeå, Sweden. The mate, Anna Carlson, uses the STM route template service to complete the actual route to Umeå. By doing this, she creates a complete plan and avoids replanning at a later stage. In the STM interface, she also decides to whom she wants to share the information. after the departure, a storm is developed ahead and threatens to delay the ship's arrival time. The mate, Anna, receives a proposal of an optimized route from a weather optimization provider. By accepting the new route, she not only avoids the storm, 
but also notify some other concerned actors on the updated voyage plan. At Shore Center, the operator receives a notification. Something is wrong. Heavy's navigator is deviating from the voyage plan and must be checked out. Since the deviation was detected in time, a possible incident could be avoided by using the enhanced monitoring service. Emma's validator is now in the Baltic Sea, and according to ice info, severe ice conditions can be expected. This time, reduced speed and delays can be avoided. The logistical puzzle of ports, pilots, tugboats and linesmen must be torn up and remade once again. With STM port call synchronization, you will be assisted doing this without lifting your phone. So simple operations in the STM interface briefs every concerned actor about the new situation, giving them a chance to reschedule and report back. This time, the port proposes an even later arrival time, giving the ship the chance to accept, reduce speed, and save fuel. And this validator has reached a destination in a meal. STM reduces risks and makes the maritime transport chain more efficient. The beneficiaries will be the shipping industry, its customers, and the environment. STM makes your working days simpler and safer while maritime transport gets more efficient than ever. Um, so that is a little bit old now, and we've gone a little bit beyond simple trial and error for the arrival time. So scheduling has come a long way with um, the port call optimization, S100 uh, platform, S211 it is. And there's also been further work done on ensuring that we have better weather routing, for example. And that came out after, so in 2018 and 2019, the El Ferro sank with all hands on deck in the middle of a hurricane. And in 2020, the Livestock One did the same thing, exactly. So we've got a bit better with our weather and sharing weather now. Unfortunately, a lot of people die because we're very good at being reactive and not proactive. But this whole project was proactive. I've left it on this slide on purpose. No crews involved. When we're talking smart shipping or Internet of Things, when we're talking digitization, we need to talk coordinated entities that all have areas of expertise. Look at the big names up here. We've got Carnival. Uh, we've got Transas. We've got the Saab, Switzer, Wurzilla. Uh, we've got Universities, Chalmers. So we've got Anfruno there, Signalis. We've got Swedish Maritime Administration. So you've got authorities, you've got academics, you've got technical providers all working together. And I think it's one of the most exciting things about the whole concept of going smart in ports. Because we're seeing connections, we're seeing work between entities that normally wouldn't have done that. But we're seeing the results of it. So that is a bit old. I apologize, it is 2018. We've come further than that. That was the end of a series of trials that happened. But it's pretty cool, eh? On board the ship, on the shore, weather routing, really looking at how we're putting together all the different technologies. I'm going to turn that off because it's on YouTube. I let it play, you're going to get something I don't know what at the end. We'll close that one down. Good. Okay. I hope I didn't close out Google Meet. No, I didn't. Good. Excellent. So we have developments that are coming. Now, there's another bit of developments here. This is from the Republic of Korea. They have done a lot of work on what they call smart navigation. They base it on the IMO e-navigation, but they've also looked at non-solvers. So, STM. The concepts of STM are based on the big ships, the solar ships. 
There's a lot of ships out there that are not soulless. There's fishing boats, there's pleasure craft, there's a, the ferries I was on today. That would be not a soulless class vessel. So how do they fit into this? What South Korea, what the Republic of Korea have done is they put together a project over a number, again, this is 2019, so only one year earlier, one, one year fresher. They put together a whole pile of projects on addressing smart navigation, but including, you can see them, including these guys. Now, I'm not sure if you remember your history much, it's not even that long ago. The Siwa Ferry in the Republic of Korea sank, and a whole pile of students died. And that was part of the impetus to move forward and to include non soulless vessels, because the ferries don't come under soulless. And they had inaccurate positioning for the vessel, they had inaccurate information on how many people even were on board. And so they decided they had to do something specific about that. Did you have a point on that? Why did it take so long? Yeah, a lot of fishing boats disappear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, IMO deals with big class ships. So they don't have fishing vessels. There is the IUFF, IWF, sorry, the International Union of Fishing. Oh, you caught me on the acronym there. But they do work on it internationally, but it's not under the SOLAS, under the IMO umbrella. And yeah, we need to do more for the non solar vessels. GMBSS. Global Maritime Stress and Safety System came into being. You remember? You don't remember. But in 1997, GMDSS came in and they said, listen, you don't have to listen to Channel 16 anymore. We've got GMDSS. Everyone's going to have digital select calling. Well, no. Only the vessels above a certain size would have digital select calling. So we actually had to fight to get IMO to re retract the listening option. You can still call on Channel 16 on VHF radio. Thank goodness. 2182, no. 2182 used to be the MF frequency for distress and calling, and they pulled that back. Um, they did pull back. They've got channel 70, DSC channel 70, but you need a DSC unit to get on channel 70. So all those vessels without DSC, at a time, were not going to be able to talk to any shore station because there wasn't going to be channel 16. Um, we, we managed to change that just in time. But we have this, this thought that we think about big ships, like the navigator, like the validator, sorry, um, Anna's validator. In order for us to deal with all classes of ships, we have to address all of their needs. And I think that this was a cool project. Specifically, they, they included the non soulless vessels. Now, you can't figure out, they're smart, it's different smart again. <laughs> they use smart technology, but they went beyond it. So they called it, come on, let me do it. There you go. Sea traffic coordination optimization, maritime domain awareness, active and proactive maritime safety management, remote assistance, and maritime telematics. That's a good word, telematics. What does telematics mean? You can Google it. I'll let you check it. What does telematics mean? What does telematics mean? What's that? It's like telecommunication, so yes, you've got tele in there. What is telematics? Anybody find it? Definition? Who's got it? Someone said yes? Okay, I'm coming back. Here you go. The brands of information technology which deals with the long distance transmission of computerized information. Isn't that a great word? We should all know that one. Long distance transmission of computerized information. Why do we use telematics much more? It is exactly what we're looking at. We're looking at how to transmit digital data over longer distance. And so they put it right into their project. Um, this has come a long way over a number of years. And um, from, from the point of view of small vessels, fishing vessels, it was started because of fishing vessels. It was started off because of small ferries and fishing vessels and it's grown into an incredible project. We're just keeping going. So that's one of the projects that are going there. And this is where you come to the research you did. Okay, so what are other examples of this introduction of different types of technology on a large scale? So we looked at individual 
like wearables and sensors and all of that. Something on the scheme of smart technology in the Republic of Korea or those projects from the Mona Lisa, Sea Traffic Management. So what did you find? So you've done the research already. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes just to consolidate the research you did before I arrived. And uh, we'll pass around and I want some of these, these big ticket items that are happening around the world on the introduction, other examples. Okay, I'll give you a couple more minutes just to consolidate the work you did while I was late. Okay, that's been a couple of minutes. You already did the work. So who wants to go first? I won't make every table go this time, but who wants to go first? What did you find in that research that you did for the half hour that I was late? So hopefully you did some. Okay, good. I'm coming and you can talk. This time, uh, what I thought was the usage of Internet of Things on board a ship. Uh, it is nothing like a, it is more of a, what I thought was a mobile phone control. Mobile phone control. It is more of a remote control system where we can use a single mobile phone to control all the opening and closing of hatch covers, and then, as you said, fuel inspection, tank inspection, as well as uh, the electrical system. Uh, wastage of electricity can be reduced by. Uh, one person is controlling the, controlling the mobile phone who can switch it on or off and then opening or closing of doors as well as uh, emergency firefighting system as uh, my friend already uh, mentioned about the automatic automatic electronic fighting system which that can also be controlled. So internet of things on board a ship is what I... Uh, That's excellent and, and let's think about ourselves. Yes, Pat. Sorry, I get so excited I forgot to do that. So the Internet of Things on board a ship, and let's go beyond even having somebody control it and have it initially controlled by parameters that are electronically set so that when certain conditions are met, something happens. But always have an override because remember the humans in the loop. Okay, who else wants to go? Yeah. Morning, everyone. So while we are still on the topic of IoT, uh, uh, and uh, the implementation that we found was IoT integrated temperature regulated cars. This uses IoT to uh, sensors to uh, monitor the temperature of humidity of cargo and adjust accordingly. Um, then uh, something else is uh, smart defense alarm system. Um, in case of an assault, in case of a pilot attack or something. Um, it alerts the nearest security vessel post guard on every ship. And, and from that last one, we do have something called the ship security alert system, but it doesn't go necessarily to the nearest coast guard automatically because it's not geofenced. It goes to the monitoring system for that vessel. So it could go to the flag, it could go to a fleet monitoring area but it doesn't actually go to the person closest because it's not linked at the moment to a geographic polygon. So the ship itself, just imagine a ship of itself having a, I don't know, put an imaginary polygon around it of, I don't know, two miles or something. And it's traveling along and anything that comes within that triggers an alert for the ship to know about. Um, you have to minimize it when you got into a port environment because you go a lot closer <laughs> to other ships. Um, I think in Singapore one time, I was saying, well, what's the what's the CPA in a ship that the man, old man gives you? The, sorry, I shouldn't call him the old man. The captain gives you the closest point of approach. And they said, well, it's paint to paint because they come so close together. Um, my captain always had a minimum of five cables. I wasn't allowed to have a ship within five cables of my ship. Otherwise, I would be in trouble. 
But we could have a cape, we could have this area that would be scalable as a ship is transiting. It would have an alert system as soon as it senses something. You've got sensors, you could have CCTVs, you could have um, sensor systems, arrays, ultraviolet light. As soon as a pirate comes in, you get an alert. That alert goes to the ship and also to the nearest Coast Guard. Wouldn't that be great? We can do lots of technology. Okay, who's next? Good morning, all. Uh, our group has signed a couple of uh, smart shipping technologies that are happening. Uh, they are automatic truck, automatic trains, automated tired vehicle, uh, digital train technology, electronic data in the exchange, uh, 5G wireless networks, uh, 3D operation stimulation, and other 600 series. I could talk for days about S100. Um, some other aspects, 5G. I actually didn't, I, I might pull a slide in at lunchtime about 5G because there's some pretty cool stuff happening with the 5G technology. Okay, who's next? Good morning, everyone. Uh, the topic we have selected is like, if we have a smart weather data system that you know, on board ship, which is uh, integrated with the ship's propulsion system and also APIS can enhance the onboard operation and also the time to arrival of ship can also be enhanced and also it can reduce the damage caused due to these weather disasters and if, if this smart weather data system can uh, integrate with the ship and port also the port can also predict the ship status and also arrange the uh, ETA, ETD etc. Thank you. And now you start seeing why I said that something from 2018 is a bit old, um, because it was a really big step forward. One thing we learned is that the speed of acceleration is accelerating. We'll talk a little bit more about that again. So 2018, only four years ago, seems the technology we've come a long way already. Who's next? Good afternoon. Uh, yes, a single window system for uh, coordinating search and rescue operations all around the world. So when we are sailing in a ship, there will be a uh, confusion that uh, like we are working with a multi-lingual uh, crew, so there will be a uh, confusion that which country has to rescue them. So the single window, uh, single window system for coordinating search and rescue operations all around the world by the coordination of Navy and Coastal Guards of different nations around in the world who are engaged in sea trade. So uh, this can also solve the confusion uh, between countries in rescue operation if the vessel contains multi multi Thank you. Who's next? There is a GMDSS modernization project underway to bring that technology up to speed. We can actually have a much safer system for our safety, our search and rescue. Now, with that, remember that list of all of the companies that work. When you're talking search and rescue, you've got to bring in aviation. So then you have all of those aviation companies as well. So we are seeing very large groups of people working together. I think you had your hand up. The ground job, the smarter shipping technology which our group discussed is the IoT, that is the Internet of Things. It enables the users to control the everyday objects with the help of a consolidated system and it provides remote control to the vessel operator that would have otherwise required the physical presence. So, uh, as an application in the container ships, IoT enables the control of hatch, hatch doors and bulkhead system so that they can be closely monitored using uh, during loading and unloading operations. Thank you. Okay, it might be, uh, how's, how are you guys doing? Got some more who want to share? Let's see who's next. Who's next? You? Yeah. Oh, who? Where? Did you guys have your hand up? 
Yes, okay. What's that? Go. They go first? Okay. You're making me walk? They already went. <laughs> Here you go. So, all my friends were telling about different innovations and technology that has been, that has been used on board ship. So, I would like to think differently. Uh, I would like to uh, talk about augmented reality that should be used in training institutes. So, to give a better training for the upcoming seafarers so they can be more advanced when they are on the boat after coming and realizing how things work in the sea using an augmented reality in a simulator, etc. So, they will be more aware. But how to steer how different situation awareness will get more situation awareness. So I think uh, the thing which we discussed was often the reality which is going to revolutionize the shipping industry in the near future. Excellent, thank you. Now I think we might be starting to get some duplications of technology. Has anybody got anything different that hasn't been mentioned yet? Walking slowly forward, any hands raised? Okay, let's move on then. Oh, we do have one more. Good. Uh, it's not a big ship, but uh, yeah, no, like what's your metro? Uh, like it's a hybrid moving system and smart metro system with the advanced digitalization and with a hybrid uh, propulsion system, protein attack. So, hybrid propulsion system, and uh, I'm linking it back to that smart metro, that green, that, um, was it? Go blue, think green. That's a great logo. Think blue. Think blue, that's right. Think you blue, think blue, go green. Yes, the other way around. It's a good logo. Anything new? Anything else? Yes, one more. It could be a possible idea, but it hasn't been integrated yet. So, I think we can go for something known as an IoT integrated ballast pump system, which generally checks the pH of the water of the ballast along with uh, the one outside compared to the one inside, so that we can prevent drifting and you know, for, uh, like layover period for ships and cargo can move faster. And also, it prevents a lot of like environmental issues like uh, invasion of spawning species. That's a great idea, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So IoT monitoring of ballast water, not for the amount that you have, not for the temperature, but for the pH, comparing it with the pH of the water outside, because we do know that we have issues with ballast water transfer and the introduction of invasive species. Okay, I think we've done a really good job on all of those. You did some really good work while I wasn't here. So I'm impressed, thank you. And I will say again, because I'm Canadian, I'm sorry that I was late. I'm trying to keep us on time. But I don't want to rush you along too much. So I've got to move out of that one and into my mouse. Where are you? I'm getting my mouse back. There it is. So we're going digital. We've gone smart. In order to go smart, you have to go digital. What does it mean to be digital? We talked about digital thinking and analog thinking. But digital thinking is that more process, one plus one equals two. Analog thinking is one plus one is equal to two. But if you have an issue with one, can you make it a two? And then you can do another two, and then you can minus, you know, if you have a, a way of thinking. Our minds go differently than a computer. We did talk about nature and nurture and programming. So, yeah, it's a, it's a long story, but really, computers think the way they're told to think. We think, yes, we think the way we're told to think, but we also think for ourselves. And we change, and our minds can change. So going digital. I spoke about this earlier, and I'm coming back to it because it's really important in the concept of how we're getting to where we're going, and why 2018 seems like a long time ago. So digitization. That is when you're converting something that's analog to digital directly, or something like a, a PDF of a document. You can take a picture on your phone now and make a PDF. That is digitization. Digitalization is different. So it's only a little bit different in terminology, digital and digitize. 
but digitalization means that you're making the best benefit out of the data at the digital format. So that PDF document has information on it. Digitalization takes a look at that information and not at the document. So it's making the best use of what computers do good. Digital transformation is when you're actually moving economies, institutes, organizations into this idea of using digitalization. And then you get to a dynamic enterprise which responds to all those changes and is very responsive. And we did talk about technology, we did talk about organizations and structures of organizations. We work in a rather analog world. If you think of the UN, the United Nations, and underneath that you've got the IMO and the ITU and the ICAO, and under the IMO you've got committees, and under the committees you've got subcommittees, and they meet maybe once a year, and the subcommittee has to report to the committee, and then the committee has to report to the assembly. So for things to happen, in the structure we have right now, it takes a long time. It's not agile. Have you heard of that term agile? Um, so you've got agile program management you can do, which means that you're able to move as the technology, as the requirements change. You're agile. Dynamic enterprise is looking at getting more agile. Now, the maritime industry is not terribly agile at the policy level. Go back to my first pillars. One of them was policy and that, that strategy. They take time to come, but we need to be agile. So it's almost like we're a Dr. Jekyll and a Mr. Hyde sort of thing. On one side, we want to be all policy driven and everything. On the other side, we want to be agile. And it's, it's a really interesting time in maritime now to see how it's happening. COVID was actually wonderful in one way because the IMO actually had online meetings. People could attend online. They're able to have more meetings. The heads of all of these big organizations started having one hour sessions once or twice a week to see if they could deal with the COVID issues. Well, let's keep it up, guys, because that's agile. Next. Oh, there we go. So, the industries, Industry 1.0, go back to the late 1700s. We got into steam power. We started mechanizing. Really cool. Back in the late 1800s, mass production, assembly line, made things faster. Late 1970-ish, automation, computers, electronics started showing up. They were bloody big. We were looking at some of the phones from the 1970s. They're these huge, big blocks, bigger than that water bottle. That was a mobile phone. 1990s and on, industry 4.0, cyber systems, IoT, and networks. Well, we're going to move on a bit there on that. Change is accelerating. While we've been in Industry 4.0, things have changed dramatically. Really, really, really quickly. Which is exciting. So we've gone from a silo enterprise to this, I love this table. I don't know if you can see it back there, you probably can't, it's wonderful. Socially valued, service oriented, dream based innovation. If you can dream it, probably technology can do it. That is pretty amazing. So we really moved in well less than a normal industrial sort of moving from industry one to industry 2.0, about a hundred years. About 40 years, we have significantly made progress. And it's really interesting because it's linked to something called Moore's Law, which is slowing down, but we won't get into that, but I do want to get into this. This is the concept of innovation. And as technology increases, you can see types of innovation increasing. So mechanization, back into that industry 1.0. Take a long time for things to happen. Have a lot of developments. Oops, sorry, in your way. Then we're getting into that industry 2.0. Steel, railroads, everything happening there. Oh, electricity got developed. Whew, pretty cool. Well, it was always there. We just didn't know it was there. We discovered electricity. We made use of electricity. Chemicals, cars coming into being here. So we've got that long low, a bit more of a bump, a bit more exciting. TVs, aviation, computers, a bit more. Yes, I did have black and white TV. Someone commented on that last time. 
biotech and, IO, and IT, 1990s, and look at the size of that. And here we are in this concept of sustainability. We're trying to use technology, dream-based innovation, to give us sustainability. But if you think about that line, and anyone who did see Moore's Law, Moore's Law actually goes a bit more like that, but our technology developments are coming faster. And that's why 2018 seems like a long time ago now. So 2018, if anybody has an iPhone from 2018, good luck. If anyone has computers from 2018, well let it date. So we have things changing so quickly. And um, can I help you? Can you help? Pardon? Oh, is it time? Oh, yes, you have to go now? Let me see how my time is. Nobody told me about that. Hmm. Not everybody? 12.16, okay. Um, I, I have been told that lunch is at 12.45, so if you have to go, I have to go, but... Oh, no, they're going for prayer. How long will it be? Okay, so if you have to go for prayer, that's fine. Um, but I'm going to continue to 12.45 for lunch. Okay? So those who need to go for prayer, please feel free to go. No problem. We will continue, and your colleagues will fill you in and you get back. And so that everybody get out so it doesn't disrupt everybody else. Okay. So we're seeing a big change. That means we are now into this Industry 5.0, and I did promise you I'd talk about that. Industry 5.0 is, <laughs> we're not going to wait to 2090. We're basically there now. We're moving now so quickly. Things are changing so quickly because technology lets us do it that we're now into Industry 5.0. Okay, is everybody gone for prayer? Who needs to go for prayer? Okay, I don't want to keep you late. Okay. So Industry 5.0, Cyber Physical Cognitive Systems. And they're actually, that's, that's the words they're giving it now. Not officially there, but I would say, in you know, 2020s, somehow we are reaching that concept. Cyber Physical Cognitive Systems. Now some of the visionaries are saying that this will be characterized by, not wearables, but internals. Bionic attachments. Passwords in your wrist. Just go, those are my passwords. Don't have to worry about anybody hacking it in unless they cut my wrist. What's that? Yes, yeah, cyberpunk revolution. So, Industry 5.0 is linking all of those technologies and thinking about that dream-based, I love that word, dream-based innovation. You dream it, you think it, probably it can happen. Now this will come to something I'm going to talk a little bit about, about education and training. I mean, I can't tell you what you need to know. I can only tell you what's happening because I don't know what you're going to need to know. Because things are changing so fast. Look at, look at the speed of change. How can I possibly based on my history and knowledge, tell you what you're going to need to know. Because it changes so fast. So all I can do is let you know that things are changing fast and start being excited because you can make things happen. So Industry 5.0. Industry for Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence, which we've already grown up. So that's great, thank you. Machine Learning and Artificial Intelligence. An artificial neural network. Okay, what's a neural network? Take the artificial off. What's a neural network? Yell it out, anybody. A neural network. Okay, what do you think it is? What's neural? That word neural, what does it mean? Neural means of, oh, someone's phone went. 200 rupees to the mission to see first. Neural means brain. We've been talking about cognition. Cognition happens in your brain. So we're talking about the way the brain works. And we actually had neuroscience in the class yesterday as well. We learned about neuroscience. The way the neural networks are happening. Our brains are these synapses of magnetic, of electric shocks that are going back and forth. If it doesn't go one way, it finds another way. So if something breaks, they can find another way. So they've got these networks. Artificial neural networks. It is a network of computer nodes joined together to mimic the way a human brain works. 
Well, that could be exciting or scary. Are we making humans out of robots? Kind of an interesting thought. But it will mimic the way the human brain analyzes and processes information, and those are the foundation of AI. So a neural network. And the fact is, as a network, it means that if I want to get over there and my route is here and it's blocked, I can go here and still get there. So it's not linear, it's a network. Now within that, we've got three levels. Artificial intelligence is probably the dumbest level, if you want to say it that way. These are techniques that enable a machine to mimic a human intelligence using different types of methods and they implement it with software. So is this going to mimic what I was told to do? I tell the computer that one plus one equals two, one plus one will always equal two. I tell the computer that to get over there you have to go this way, it will go that way. If there's a block, it will stop because it won't know enough to go another way. That's artificial intelligence. Machine learning is a subset of AI. It uses a statistical technique big data analytics, all sorts of cool stuff in the background to enable the machine to improve its experience. So I'm told I can go this way, there's a block. Oh, well last time I went that way. Since I can't go this way, I've learned that I can go back now and go this way. So you're getting to that concept of machine learning. But again, it's not that smart. It will only machine learn what it's been taught. So you, you teach it in a certain way, and it will make connections based on what it's been told to make connections on. If it goes beyond that, it's going to be lost. So if I got here and it was blocked, I got there and it was blocked, well, if I'm like a, a drone, I could probably go up and over, but I don't know about that, so I can't do that. Then you get deep learning. Now, deep learning is kind of a no man's land right now. There's lots of great stuff happening. It's, it's all very very futuristic, but it is software training itself using multi-layer neural networks. So not just a neural network, but multiple levels. So every single brain here network together to form a multiple layer of neural networks and data to do deep learning. So this comes to what I was saying earlier in the week. Right now, machines are still stupid. They do what we tell them to do. This deep learning is kind of exciting, kind of scary. We are, as humans, able to make inferences, to, to go and to jump to incredible innovations because we talk to each other, because we've got lots of brains working on something. If you are artificial intelligence, that's pretty cool. That just means that it's going to do what I tell it to do. That we can handle. We get into machine learning, it's getting a bit smarter, but still, it's moving on a set of parameters. If we get into deep learning, it's like every one of your brains now working together in a machine to come to solutions that it didn't have before. So we're not quite sure where we're going on that. And then the question comes into ethics, just because we can do it, should we do it? I came back to, I watched Battlestar Galactica, anybody in Star? a science fiction fan, Battlestar Galactica's, not many. Anyways, they have this whole thing about the premises that the war started with the with the cyborgs or with the skin jobs, they called them, because they looked like people, because they had deep learning and they actually rebelled. So it's this whole idea of robots. Isaac Asimov's I, Robot, science fiction from the 1960s. We now get into science fact. Kind of interesting the laws of robotics. We'll see what happens. But we're definitely at artificial intelligence and we're definitely at machine learning. Deep learning, well, things change so fast. I don't know, perhaps in a year from now I would be here saying, oh, deep learning is excellent, look what it can do. Right now I don't know much about it. I don't think many people do. I'm not a software designer, I'm not a scientist. I'm a simple sailor. I started my career like you, the age of 18 on a ship, as a cadet. And, and here I am talking about deep learning, I never would have thought about that. So it's well out of my area of expertise, but I know enough about it to know that it's coming, 
it could be exciting. It's something we need to watch. But I also know that we do this. In fact, at Ayala, in a working group I manage, I chair, we have just developed a, a guide, very light level guideline, the first guideline for Ayala members on machine learning and artificial intelligence, and another guideline on IoT. So they're not published yet. They should be through the Ayala Council in December. So in 2023, hopefully they'll be up on the Ayala website. What I can do is, those who are connected with me on LinkedIn, I'll let you know as soon as they're up, and there'll be information available there. Which now brings me to the uses of AI. So we talked a lot about, we've actually got into this a little bit, but I do want to get some more thoughts about AI and machine learning specifically. So we're looking more at IoT. I want you to think now about AI, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now that you know what it is, a little bit more, some of you I think are doing an AI and machine learning course, is that right? Anybody here? Hands up if you're doing it. I know that's happening, I think on Saturdays, isn't it? Uh, yeah, so sorry. Oh, you're gonna make it the Saturday or you're gonna miss it? <laughs> don't know. So I know that you're doing that, so you'll have a little bit of a step up on this. I want you to think about examples anywhere, any type of it. Doesn't have to be in their time, but examples of where AI and machine learning are in use right now. Okay? So AI and machine learning in use right now. And I will we will take that up and I'm actually going to write them down. I think we got a comment. You have a comment? Nope. Okay. So I want you to think about where is AI machine learning? So this is not just Internet of Things. This is actually artificial intelligence and machine learning. Where is it being used? Examples that are happening right now. I won't talk about deep learning because I don't think it's happening anywhere that's outside of the military. Um, but AI and ML definitely are in play now. I will give you, let's see how we're doing for time. I'll give you 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes. I'll check in at five minutes. You might be done by five minutes from now, so that's good, but I'll give you maximum 10 minutes.
Okay, I did say a chicken at five minutes. How are you guys doing? Do you all have at least one example? Yeah? Okay, good, excellent. So let's leave it there just because I do want to make sure we get you off to your lunch on time. We've got 15 minutes left. So I'm going to do a pass the mic and what I'll do is I'll be putting it on on the screen as we go. So you'll need to speak clearly and slowly on the examples you have. And everyone else needs to be quiet. So who wants to go first? Okay. Give me a second to get my screen up. Okay. Yeah, I'll send it again to so uh, this is to treat diseases like cancer or autoimmune diseases. So just by putting in a blood sample, uh, we can find out where the genetic issue is that is on the DNA level. And if there is any possible correction that can be done with the existing set of data, or if there is something new to be invented, then uh, people and AI can work together to make the difference. Okay, next. Who's next? Uh, uh, we would like to add uh, the development of AI in maritime sector, like uh, uh, help to analyze the past data and also it, and also to analyze whether the past data is suitable for the present scenario, like APA protein, for example, we are taking an APA protein, uh, radar tracking, then uh, predict whether short as possible routes. Take me a second because I'm typing at the same time. So you guys can go ahead without me. Yes. Hey, user, navigation that include, uh, drastically include traveling, then e payments. Oh, e payments, another one. Okay, so we're talking, yeah, yeah, okay. That's good. Let me get my mouse on here. What's going on? There we go. Okay. Digital assistance. What kind of digital assistance? The face, uh, facial detection and recognition. Okay, that's enough. That's enough. We'll pass on. Well done. The latest uh, AI uh, advancements in healthcare. The latest development of artificial intelligence in the healthcare world is enabling improvements in accurate diagnosis, clinical decision making, and optimal patient care. So, they have gone like technical thing like NASA, like maritime automated surface ships. So, they use like AI for like every system like humans and machines. And for the machine, I think they use like supervised and unsupervised and deep learning networks for the automated operations. We were to speak about artificial intelligence and machine learning. We do have Elon Musk who, who works on it day and night. And we would like to speak like we would like to say on transportation sector, like uh, 
cars like Tesla, car companies like Tex Tesla, Kia, you know, they work on these artificial intelligence. Uh, to predict the upcoming problem for any uh, insecure thing happening, and then they automatically like take their uh, way go on. Hello. So this all are kind of very, uh, you know, like on high trend uses and very specific. I'll tell you a very basic example. Like everyone cleans their houses, so there is a cleaning machine comes that automatically analyzes the house and everything, and it goes on cleaning. And if anything comes, then it detects it and it improvises it and does everything. Detecting phishing websites. Detecting? Oh, phishing, yes, yes. Who's next? Who's next? Anyone left? There you go, over there. And then we need two tables from the back to put your hands up as well so i think we need to make sure we get to the back just because i'm up here doesn't mean i'm not looking back there uh, i would like to add uh, ai in entertainment such as games um, there's uh, chess bots that can defeat human there's a, there's a bot called b blue that defeated gary kasparov in 1997. That's what I, I like to add. It's been around a while, eh? So somebody towards the back. Yep. Uh, AI and ML can be used in maritime industry for optimizing fuel consumption and emission reduction. Also, AI and ML is that is cyber security. It can be used for planning, shipment of containers, so for predictive scheduling. Two more. I'm going to run out of space. It's all right. It's good. <laughs> Another favorite example of uh, ML is uh, CD and Alexa. <laughs> Sometimes I get really mad at Siri. It comes on when I don't want it to. One more. Last one. Uh, so we can use AI or machine learning in retailing. For example, uh, if we give certain inputs like the price and the square feet of the house and if the house has a garden or not, I think we can use AI to predict the prices of uh, real estate accordingly in a certain technical area. So, in uh, uh, considering like a uh, highly esteemed places, I think according to the uh, previous given in the outputs, it will be uh, used for predicting prices. That's wonderful. I'll take it back up now. That's fantastic. What a great. Oh, okay. One last one. They put their hand up. Yes. Okay. I'm running out of space. This is good, though. GP3. GP3. So everyone else is talking and I can't hear, so please be quiet. Now go ahead, please. I, I can't hear. Generative train the transformer three. Generative P three. P three? I I don't I am not hearing right. It is an auto free train. 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 Free train.
if it is so high that is and can be a difficult to determine whether or not it was written by a human okay i need all for that everyone's so loud i can't hear i'm so sorry because it sounds really great so generative pre train trans is that it okay is that right on the screen gpd3 gpd3 uh, okay it's a generative pre train transformer 3 Yes, it's an auto regressive language model that was yeah. that uh, uses deep learning to produce human like text. This uh, the third generation language prediction model. Mm -hmm. The quality of the text generated by GPT-3 is so high that it can be difficult to determine whether or not it was written by a human. And it's so cool. So thank you. Sorry. I just thank you so much. That's much better. Let's speak up loud. Now that's it. That's a great one. To end on. Please bring it to me. Sorry, I just couldn't hear with all that noise. There's a reason why I say one person speak and everyone would be quiet because there was little bits. It wasn't loud, but it was enough, and that I couldn't understand what was being said. So thank you so much. And that's an excellent one to end on because there was a system called Dragon. at one time that was taking um voice to text and so it would do that but this whole concept of the language and language independent communications that we have because we have translators is great look at the list that we got of what's happening already in AI and ML and thank you for going to some of the really basic stuff because we do have basic stuff we actually have assisted parking in our cars now and that is an ai is using sensors is identifying and is making decisions for us new cars i don't have one but new cars that are driving i had a rental one it's really cool i have a distance set that i will go no closer closer than the car in front of me i'm driving along um going 120 kilometers like we do in australia the car in front of me is going 100 without my even knowing it i've gone down to 100 because it's been predictive it's used ai to say you have to slow down so it's actually helping me from not having an accident which is great so we have ai around us right now and as a wonderful list i'm just going to save that list and you will have a copy of that in the powerpoint at the end and the time is now Almost lunch time. Okay, I got a couple more things just cuz I want to do this <laughs> because he did mention facial recognition. First off, I'm going to talk about concerns. So this is from the guideline that I put together for IALA. Some of the concerns. These are only some of the high-level concerns of AI. And we need to be concerned again, just cuz we can doesn't mean we should. What are the unintended consequences of our actions by using the technology? It was really great to have this technology, but what are the unintended consequences? So, a concern in AI is the bias. Who's done the programming? Do they have a bias? What's the accuracy? What's the transparency? How do I know how accurate? How do I know what that AI is doing? Because you can't get into the machines themselves. And as machine learning happens, if there's an incident and a ship was using AI, and that incident is investigated two years later. what kind of machine learning level was that machine on at that time because it will be on a different one now things will change so how do i get that conflict between different ai systems patenting and costs and then because of patenting and costs you've got the cheap offshoots and do they work maybe maybe not the commercial value of the systems and data privacy issues So we have a lot of things that we are concerned about with AI. And I'm going to go back a few centuries to Jean Piaget. Not quite that far. But Jean Piaget once said, "What we see changes what we know, and what we know changes what we see." So as we are progressing along this realm, what our concerns are now are likely not going to be concerns in the future. We're going to have new ones. So what we know changes what we see. 
what we see changes what we know, and it keeps going back and forth. And so I want to do something, a little of an experiment with you. What do you see? I doubt, someone said. So what do you see? A face upside down. Yeah, an upside down face, okay. That's what the AI might be seeing, right? What do you really see? So what do you see? That's it upside right. So one of the concerns about facial recognition is how is it recognizing the face? Who taught it to recognize the face? What their biases are? But this is called the factor effect. This actually comes from before AI really got going. Anybody remember a lady by the name of Margaret Thatcher? Yeah, so it came about where someone did a picture of her and put it upside down and it looked strange. But if you look at it now, it doesn't look that bad until you know. You know now, don't you? Because what you know changes what you see. So you can you take a look at it. Okay, what's well, so some of the differences? We've got that and this. If you look at it, go back again. It doesn't look wrong, does it? It doesn't look wrong, but it is so wrong until you turn it the other way. So let's put them beside each other. So what you know changes what you see, and what you see changes what you know. What does the AI see? So facial recognition has probably been one of the most contested aspects of AI over the years. It's getting very good now, much better than it was. But the Thatcher effect really does highlight some of those concerns of using AI. And I apologize for doing that for you right before you have your lunch. Because you're going to have those lovely images in your face while you're going for lunch. <laughs> okay, it's lunch time now, guys. I think lunch is 45 minutes. Yeah, I'm back on track so we can have 45 minutes for lunch. Well, no, not quite. Four zero minutes for lunch. Four zero minutes for lunch. Come back at one three two eight. We start at one three three zero. Oh, off, off, not just muted. Sorry, yeah, I was just muting it. Thank you. I just muted it so it doesn't save the battery. Yeah. Practice session. I need some things pulled together. I'll be under my angle is too.
Yes, I am. I'm just going to get something ready because they want me to do a faculty session, which I only learned about this morning. Okay. So I've got a full uh, okay. presentation together. So okay. I'll, I think I go for lunch on the other side, don't I? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll go over in about five minutes. It won't okay. take long. Yeah. Okay. yeah.
doing this you're waiting for me are you that's quite something thank you i just realized that it's on the screen there so. they're waiting for me are they yes yes of course they are i don't want that one up oh. what's going on here so i can turn that off for a second Go back to here I'm done. I think we're just done. Let's go to here. I'm not done yet. A second. Maybe I'm not done in a second. Second. There it is. Okay. Now I'm done. Now I'm done. Now I'm coming. Sorry.
It's not everybody's back, they don't put them in it. Looking at going on it. Okay, you can make it. Oh, you just can do them. Okay, thank you. What is the table? You know. So they're not here yet. Some of them are. Which is good. How do we make it really good? Hello. Okay, where's everybody? Oh, goodness, the room's emptied out. It is now past 15.30, so we are starting. So if they're not here, we're starting. How do we need to get going? I only have until 1500 today. I'm so sorry. So I've had to let one section go. On your table, on your table, you have what's called a wuzzle, a word puzzle. It's a word puzzle. What I want you to do to get those brains going, now that we've had a wonderful lunch. I had fish curry. What did you guys have? Chicken curry. I actually had fish and chicken and paneer. And I really just... <laughs> yes, that's right. So my circadian rhythms, I have to watch those. Those circadian rhythms, those are the times when you feel most sleepy. Okay, on your desk you have a word puzzle. There's a set of them. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Yes, you can turn them over now. Those who aren't here are going to lose that on time. I'll give you 10 minutes to figure them out. I'll give you one as a start, so you get the idea. Actually, someone who's done this before might be able to get the first one out. There's one really easy one. There's one really easy one on there. Can you figure it out? It's the lower left-hand corner one. That's probably the easiest one. Yes, big mouth. Well done. So, you get the hang of it. So, you take a look at the lower left-hand corner. The answer to that word puzzle is big mouth. Now, do you see why? It's the word mouth, and it's really big. So, take a look and see how many more you can get. And they're all linked to this concept of communications that we were talking about earlier. So, pretty much anyways. So, I'll let you... Get going on those 10 minutes. I'm going to get the clock going. We'll see how you're doing.
Okay, so even better. Some people have come back. For those who joined late, we are three minutes into an activity where you are looking at those word puzzles and trying to fill in as many as you can. The lower left hand corner one is big mouth, so you get a hang of how to do it. So think about them. Try and fill them in. And if anyone gets them done, all of them, put your hand up and I'll come and check them. I'm doing the Zoom right now for you. I'm doing the Zoom for you right now. Do you want which email do you want it to? The IMU one or your Yahoo printed? Do you want it to go to your university one or your Yahoo address email? University. university. Okay. I hope I did it right. Okay. Ah, I hear someone got one right. I hear it. <coughs> Thank you. 
Has anybody have all of them yet? You've got five, so it's one missing. There you go. Oh, you got something since you've got those six. Come and take a look at the C. You're almost there, I think. Let's see. Let's spin the group because they got it. We have all six. Not quite, didn't get 100%, but they were close. I'll take that. Yes. I'll take that. No. Almost. Okay, close. Let's see how you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll take that. Yep. To what? To the radio? Okay. Yeah, or the other way. Yeah, okay. So that one's the most. A little bit. Not quite there. Okay. Is it closer so far? Let's see. I'll come back in a second. Take that one. I'll take that. Okay, I'll take all of those. Yes? Okay. This one. I got it. Who said ma'am? Who said ma'am? There we are. It's strange to be called a ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Okay, what do we got? No. Oh, I'll take that one. It's kind of cool. Yes. Okay, I'll take that one. Uh, that's definitely right. Okay, so close. No. <laughs> but I will take that. I think our 10 minutes are up. Anybody else? Want me to take? Get them all? Let's see. No. Not quite. That's really cool. So I will take that. Definitely. No. Close. Got some good ideas, though. This one, what's it doing? Going up. It's the radio. It's going up. It's turning up. Turn up the radio. Turn up the radio. Did you guys get it? Oh, you didn't get many at all. Oh, no, you haven't went down. Okay, get them all. That, that's right. Fill in the blanks. Yes. I'm going to give everybody the right answers now because we're done. Yes. Good work. Okay. Our time is up. You can check your own. Let me just flick the screen. I am going for you to check your own. Just one second. Our 10 minutes is up. Hopefully your brains are active again now. Let's see. Fill in the blanks. Fill in the blanks. An information gap. I also took a gap in information. I'll take that. Two-way conversation, but I like the ones that put reflective conversation. That's a really good, I like that. I'll take that, reflective. Big Mouth, I told you, turn up the radio. I accepted tuning the radio, but it's actually turn up, because you can see it's turning up. And talk back. Back talk. Yeah, it seems to be the awkward name point for me, but I can see why you would say that. But talk back. Okay, so who got all of them? Who got all six? One table, two table, three table, four table. Who got five out of six? Woo, okay. Oh, way more. Who got three, four out of six, four out of six? Four? Okay, we won't go any further than that. <laughs> so those are called puzzles. It just gives you a chance to get your brain working again after lunch. I hope you had a wonderful lunch, but the problem is after lunch, we all feel sleepy. It's not the food, it's natural. 
It's a circadian rhythm. For those who are going to be working on shifts, or those who are going to work shift work, you need to know your circadian rhythms, because that's when you're always going to feel sleepy. It's not just because you ate, it's because it's a natural physiological response. Two to three o'clock in the afternoon, and about between one and three in the morning. One and three in the morning is the biggest dip. The afternoon dip is definitely there though. So we work through that. Let's get into it. We will be done by 1500. Everyone said yes, I'm so upset. Dude. I didn't want to be here. So we had a change in plans. Let's talk about humans and machines. How do humans and machines work together? Humans do things, machines do things. We already talked about that. Humans can lead, they can perceive, they can discern, they can create. They have some limit to their capacity. Machines, they learn, they process, they decide. So they learn, they process, they decide. They can confirm things that we might say, and they also, believe it or not, have limited capacity. Uh, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. There's more and more capacity, but they do have capacity. So humans working with machines, Industry 5.0, working on those cyber cognitive aspects, machine learning and AI. I'm just going to be quiet for a second. There's lots of conversations going on, and I don't want to interrupt. There's actually one going on over there. Oh, it's been it. I better let him go. Humans and machines. So we work with humans. Machines, if we work with machines, and machines work with us. But there's tension. There's tension in the way that we work. Have you ever had a time when you just wanted to yell at your computer because it's not doing what you want it to do? Stupid computer. I talk to my computer, actually. It doesn't talk back to me, but I talk to my computer. So we sometimes have tension with machines because so they don't do what we want them to do. How about the fact that in order for me to use my mouse, I have to put my, my microphone down because I need my hand. Wouldn't it be great if I could just think, okay, mouse, I want you to do this. We have to have these human-machine interfaces, and sometimes they're not very intuitive. Sometimes you go through about 10 clicks, and you think, I could have done that in one click. Yeah. Uh, two clicks, maybe, at the max. And science is showing, actually, that we're, we're not prone to staying on a site if we have to click more than two or three times. We'll go somewhere else. We'll give up. That's it. It's not intuitive. So we have conflicts with machines. So we have humans helping machines, and that's great. Machines helping humans. Now, an example of a human helping a machine. What is a human help a machine? Programming? Algorithms? Designing the algorithms? How do humans help machines? Coding? Coding? Yeah. We're all into the coding part. How else do humans help machines? Maintenance? I'll give you a hint. Machines doing it, but I'm telling it what to do. Not doing it on its own. But it, we input the command, so humans work with machines. We tell them what to do. Give me an example of a machine helping a human. What? Smartphones. Machines help us. Uh, we had great examples of AI in medicine making huge advances. So we have machines helping humans, which is great. But we have this conflict in between. A bit of a of a give and take, a bit of a, a conflict in between those two. So, how do we make it human centric? How do we make the interaction with the machine either more helping it or it's helping us? But how do we keep the human in the loop? Uh, I most developed a guideline on that human centered design. Um, so we have that, and we have ergonomic designs for Viola as well to try and keep the human in the loop. Training and jobs. Humans helping machines, machines helping humans. So how do we train our humans to work with the machines? How do we train the machines to work with the humans? Because we know they can be trained. And what jobs do each one do? So humans do some things really well, we think. 
naturally. We come up with creative and innovative solutions really well. Machines do repeatable tasks really well. So how do we make sure that we train each one for that? Um, uh, yes, data veracity. What do I mean by data veracity? Trueness, the trueness of the data. Is the data correct? How do we know it's correct? How do we know that that beautiful picture of Vendel upside down was wrong until we looked at it the other way? Where is the checking, the error checking on the, on the technology? Standards, where are the standards? And <laughs> what else is changing? Everything's changing so quickly. So humans are working with machines. Machines are working with humans. How do we keep us in the loop? And where are those tensions coming? I popped this in there, this picture though, because augmented reality is pretty cool. Now we've heard about augmented reality. So who, we had two groups. I think you talked about augmented reality and we had a group in the back talking about augmented reality. But mostly from a training point of view. I beg your pardon? So we, we were talking about augmented reality from a training perspective. What about augmented reality to help us drive, drive our ships? Well, what about augmented reality to drive our cars right now? They have it. Uh, well, actually, and even pretty much every single car nowadays, you sit in and, and you go reverse and you've got a little camera. It's got a camera on the back. It's got these little yellow marks and green marks and red marks. That's augmented reality. You're looking at the picture with the augmentation. So this image is really cool. It's very new. It's a very much a test. I've given you the website. Um, and I mean new as in I got it yesterday from a trial that happened the day before. So this is really new stuff. We were talking about this, I think, on Tuesday. I contacted a friend of mine on Wednesday and he sent me the picture yesterday. So the trials were going on. This is a test using augmented reality for marine aids to navigation. And I was talking about the Pac-Man. I had to explain what Pac-Man is. Who knows what Pac-Man is? We got some people who play Pac-Man. So Pac-Man was a really old computer game. Pac-Man. Do you remember Pac-Man? This little guy would chomp these little yellow spots as he was walking around. We've got a Pac-Man ship going here. So augmented reality can actually help us move our ship safely along the route. So the ship here is going along the little yellow fleshes. Right now we still have aids to navigation out there. We have, we're talking about Ayala A and B and the confusion getting messed up. But what if we didn't even need the boys? Because we had virtual aids to navigation, we had virtual channels, we had these digital fairways. Now if you search that in Google, you will find work on digital fairways. So we have digital fairways happening. Where is that going to go? I don't know. These are all just rhetorical questions because it's really exciting what technology can do. But this is our, our Pac-Man future. There we go. Follow our ship there. This is a test that's going on right now. If you go to the website, you can learn a bit more about it. It used to be, we be looking decades between tests and implementation. Mona Lisa projects, they started back in 2008, 2009, and we are now seeing implementation, but that was in 2018. So it took a decade really to get to that validation project. And now four years later, it's like old technology. So the speed of change is increasing. This is happening now. I don't know, will it be there when you graduate? How many years until you graduate? Next year, it won't be next year. But it might be there in three or four years. There are trials going on. How long will it take? Depends on whether or not it gets used. It's so cool. But if we go back to here, standards. What is that standard for it? Is anyone going to implement it if it's not an IMO standard? ISO, sorry, it doesn't come out of IMO. IMO doesn't identify and mandate it, and then IMO sends it to ISO or IEC to get a standard. Will it ever be implemented? 
Thank you for the correction. Appreciate that. When I was on the ferry today, the electric ferry, they had a great little display, but it was suited for a yacht, so it's got all this great cool technology in it because it's not reliant on IMO because they don't come under solar, so they're not linked to that. So while we need to have standards, I can see the small crafts moving towards that, perhaps faster than the solar convention vessels. So depending on where you're working. But it's really neat. So this is the new technology coming. You see if there's anything else I wanted to say about that. I think you guys don't realize that I actually make notes, but I just never look at them. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things we're looking at is ACE and navigation have to be suitable for the mix of vessels. Up until now, virtual atoms using AIS were not, because not every vessel carries AIS. If we move to something that's, this, this is actually something that can be an app on your phone. If we move something that can be an app on your phone, pretty much everybody in the vessel has a telephone. So where's that mix of ACE navigation? It's gonna be pretty cool. Which brings me back to that concept, though, of can we trust it? So what is that data veracity? If I'm on a ship, am I going to be comfortable using this? We need effective regulation. Who's going to give us our regulations? IMO? Who's that? Who else? Anybody else? ITU, yeah. IMO, ITU. We work with IHO, they will develop, so we've got these, the UN, we've got the UN sanctioned bodies, we've got the NGOs and the IGOs, people who are going to work together to give us the best practice. They can't actually regulate it though. Countries can say, yes, I want that, but it won't be regulated until it's brought into law. So regulations, robust technology, it has to work. It has to work and have a battery life or whatever it needs. My telephone is very old. It dies. The battery goes out so quickly. I'm always tied to a power pack. So it has to work. It has to work when we need it. it. has to be redundant, reliable, robust, all of that. Now beyond that, so that Pac-Man driving is really kind of cool. But do you think after the Costa Concordia, perhaps, or after some of those incidents that we that we know have happened around the world, where ships have collisions or they hit rocks. Society is going to be happy with yeah. the fact that a ship is out there basically driving like a video game? Is a question. Society changes. Societal expectations do change. So how do we fit those together? If we have effective regulations, robust technology, but no values or ethics, brought in, then we're going to have unethical systems. If we have systems that have taken into account values and ethics and give us really great technology, which is sort of where we're going right now, because we're, we're advancing technology faster than the regulations can keep up, you're basically going to end up with unlawful systems. Actually, there's a lot out there already. We've got a lot of systems out there that are according to the regulations, unlawful to the letter of the law. An example is AIS MMSIs on telephones. So some people can get AIS on a telephone. It's not a system that's been tested to the International Technical Commission testing standard of 62320-1, um, but it's there, and people use it. It's like spoofing. But anyways, it can be a lot unlawful. Then if you have values and ethics, Without a fact, you have values and ethics addressed and regulations addressed, but you don't have robust systems, you have fragile technology. It's not going to work. So really, to get your trusted system, you need all of those three to be working in harmony. And that takes time. So that picture I showed you, that's here now, I have a feeling that we're going to see that timelines reduce as we see bureaucracy reduce, technology is always in advance of what regulation is. And I can't think of a time in my career where technology has not been in advance of regulation. You can do more. Pretty much that, I 
you know that you know that that dream that dream innovation you think about it you can do it but we also have to have all those others so thinking about what's required for effective regulation a legal structure but whose law the law in canada is interesting do you know in canada we're a bit of a two faces we have french and english so we have commonwealth law and we have french law based on the law of france so in our own country we even have two laws so which law supporting regulations operations compliance who's going to enforce it who's going to go out there and say are you using a virtual reality or augmented reality system that meets these standards someone has to do that robust technology what is making the technology robust is it predictable stable are there standards is there machine learning is there a deep are there things deep learning happening with those artificial neural networks and then values and ethics well whose values and ethics so this is a really nebulous term values and ethics there's different values in different cultures different values by different families we were talking about different values and individually as well yesterday so those come into play what does a society expect a number of years ago society was pretty happy with throwing plastics overboard they were pretty happy with taking all the fish they possibly could society is not good with that now society is changing societal expectations change and that changes everything when I was a kid growing up, everybody smoked. I'm wonderful now. Hopefully nobody smokes, but it's, you know, it's how bad it is. But we have less people smoking. I grew up and I had a car. My parents would have a car and I'd run around the car, inside the car, no seat belts, nothing. No baby, no baby seats, nothing. Now in Australia, North America, you can't get into a car without having a seat belt on. You can't put a baby in a car with the other baby seat. So society changes. Sensors and processing, internet of things. So sensors and processing are happening. Do we agree with that? Facial recognition when it first came in was really scary. People didn't want it. They don't like it. Now they're talking about more and more biometrics, wearables. One of my favorite TV shows, it was, um, what was it called? It was the, the pre-crime. Uh, who, who was in that? Anyways, he has an eyeball. And he, he changes his eyeball because everybody's recognizing your eyeball. So he walks in, and his new eyeball is from a tiny little guy, but he's actually a big tall guy. But you've got these, these sensors. You walk into a store, people, you put your thumbprint down. You have, oh, yeah, this is one thing I don't do now. You have these loyalty cards, right? You guys have loyalty cards here? You buy so much at a certain store, and then you get points. They know what you're buying. I lent my car to a friend of mine who went and bought some diapers for her baby. And I was getting diaper ads because <laughs> they thought it was me. Um, my babies are really old. So you've got these people who understand. So where's the society and values and ethics? How do you manage uncertainty? What's your risk appetite? And different cultures have different risk appetites. They will accept different things in societies. We were talking about driving here, stuck in traffic. What do you do? We talk about driving. And they said, well, how come this doesn't, something like this wouldn't happen in North America, for example? Well, you get traffic jams for sure. But you have roads and you have to stay in your lane. You can't possibly leave your lane. If you do, you're going to get a ticket. You're going to lose your points. So if you have a two-lane road, you stay on your side unless it's safe to pass. And there are certain roads that you can pass on. So they have a dotted line and a solid line. And that is a societal expectation. So different societies have different risk appetites you fit these together and you get a trusted system you need that trusted system in order to move forward and we're doing great so this brings me to an activity and again i see a couple people not yawning which is really normal and fully i know it's not me i know it's your circadian dip but i want to give you an activity to help you with that and it's called the circles of influence <laughs> so people know what this is i didn't do it yesterday and everyone was disappointed i'm sorry <laughs> we did another project another activity 
Circles of influence and circles of concern. If you haven't done it, you're getting the hang of it. It's a great tool. You can use this tool, and I'm teaching you this tool so you can use it any time in any aspect of your life. It is a tool that is incredibly flexible. You take a look at the big circle. The big circle is your circle of concern. These are the big questions, the things that worry you, the things that cause you problems. They go in the big circle. The smaller circle is you, is your circle of influence. So really think at you level, and, and it can be you as in the table, you as in the people here. What can you do to influence those concerns? To either change how you feel about those concerns, that's one way, or to make a change in that concern, to help fix that concern. And it can be any concern, sort of, I want you to think about concerns with regards to AI and machine learning implementation in the maritime. Now this can be anything linked to any one of those, anything actually, AI and ML, but you can think of it in trusted systems, you can think of it as in me, what am I gonna do, what's my role gonna be, how am I gonna be educate myself? So think of the big questions, put those in your concern, and then look at the influence. What can you do? What can you influence? I would like you to put at least three items in each. Try and put more in your influence work, okay? Now you can't do it in this, but the circles help. And I'll tell you why the circles help. It's one of those brain things. Cognition, remember we were talking about our brains, how our brains work. The big circle means the big issues. And that just helps your brain realize it's a big problem. The smaller circle is you, and that means that's something that you can do. So the visualization of the circles really does help. So please, do your circles and think about, pretty broad, <laughs> any, any of those big picture issues that concern you regarding the implementation of AI and machine learning in maritime. Okay, off to you. I'll check in in about 10 minutes. <laughs> Did you get the Zoom? Yeah. I've shared it. Okay. Things would be okay. Okay. Uh, so let's see, in case there's a backup, we can always go back to Google. Okay. Is that because some people won't be able to join on Zoom? <laughs> because Zoom is kind of a uh, bank. Is it? Oh, okay. Yes, it is. As for the government office. But we still uh, use it. Okay, I see. Yeah, it. So okay. So I was just thinking another one is WebEx. I don't have a WebEx account. If you have to do Google Meet, we'll have to do Google Meet. No, we should do WebEx. Would they be working. individuals joining or would be joining in a room? Individuals. Okay. So if they were in a room, that would work because I could put them into yeah. a group. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, in order to get us out of here on time, so do this activity, pack time, and then I've got about another ten minutes. You have to be up by three, eh? Yeah, it's going to be tight. I'll give them 10 minutes for this. We'll do a. I won't get every single table to present the results for this one, unfortunately. It's a shame because it's good to get the. I'll go. I'll get the first you know, five or six volunteers and then we'll move on. Yeah. Just to keep us on track because I do want to talk about OECD um, and what it means to be a maritime professional there. Yeah, okay. Thank you. 
five minutes I was walking around everyone's doing such a great job what I would like to do I don't think we'll have time to get everybody to give me their responses uh, but I will we'll see how we do we'll try and do at least five or six so who would like to go first okay this one over here okay so Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. On the part of concern, we have unemployment and troubleshooting in AI systems. And on the part of influence, we have human and machine system on board. That is a hybrid system. And offering job positions at show monitoring system. And training personnel to handle emergency situations. Good. Thank you, that job unemployment usually comes up. That's a really scary one, but you can influence it. Who's next? Hello? Okay, everybody. As we know that humans and machine collab is basically the third level of computing. So as we move on, the circles of concerns from our group are, the first one is unemployment, the second one is that there would be less contribution from humans. And the third one is that response to the sudden changes that machines can't adapt as fast as humans can. Now, moving on to the circle of influence, they are the less chance of human error. So, uh, less chance of human error. The second one is that uh, machines and human collab will improve their operating capabilities. And the third one is that there's chances that humans could get injured. Injury prone will be less as compared to that one. And the last one is there would be more of monitoring than that of human effects. I'll give my clap first. And I want to talk a little bit about some of your, in, your circles of influence. So the one, I just want to make them actually to the fact that you're going to influence the change on it. So let me see what was one of your influences. Might tweak a little bit. So less chance of human error. So I think that goes with, they've got fear of unemployment, 
and contribution to response to sudden changes. So from an influence point of view, so less chance of human error, that's a benefit. From an influence point of view, to address the, probably the unemployment is the fact that the humans would have an opportunity to work in an environment that's safer because there's less chance of error. So this is sort of tweak that a bit and make it a real influence because you can actually influence because that's you influencing the issue. Got it? Excellent. Perfect. Next group. And then I did promise them over here first. So uh, what's like using AI uh, concerns? The main concern everyone would have is privacy. Privacy threat is like one of the main concerns which AI has. So what can be done yeah, regarding that would be petition or uh, filing a petition or law, maybe something uh, which makes people have more uh, trust over them, trust over the government or over the machines, over the companies, helping them grow. And uh, one is unemployment. But what I think unemployment is, unemployment could be in the cases of uh, machine works, people working in mines, but it could help us uh, in creative works, humans could be doing creative works, making art, and other uh, opportunities would be open for them. And uh, loss of human decision making is also one of the concerns. So what the interest would be, interest would be, it could be a collaborative process. Humans can help machines with data inside uh, coding and other things, whereas machines could help them with question solving, numericals, and other things. So that's how collaborative process would work. Excellent. Those are really great ideas. Oh, so the next one is here. We have discussed that in. Uh, we have discussed that. In the part of the concern, uh, concern they are hijacking and hacking in collaboratively. And in the part of influence, we have uh, seen that fire firewall and two factor authentication system we want to find out. And over here. Good afternoon, everyone. So, when we hear AI and machine learning and deep learning and we we'll see how it can adapt and we are looking forward to the future where AI can work with us and it can adapt to the changes. So it can be kind of scary and many people are very skeptic to work with AI because when we think of AI, many people, what image comes to their mind is uh, machines taking over the world and apocalypse and world destruction and that's just sort of silly when we think about it. So what we can actually do to increase our knowledge is in classes like this, increase our awareness and uh, there are lots of material on YouTube and other internet platforms that can actually help us to understand what AI is and what it is capable of doing. So that might give us some reassurance of where we are right now and where we will be. And the other, as many groups have said, is unemployment and uh, actually has told us that one of the ways to counter that is about increasing our skill set. That's definitely something that we can do to keep us updated on the job that we are doing. And uh, another important factor is biasing. So any program is only as good as the person who is designing it or people who is designing it. So when people a particular factor or a particular component that it is working towards. So to counter that, we can actually increase the capacity of people working to create a program or increase the supervision <laughs> that is going into creating the program for AI. Thank you. Thank you. Very good points and lots of good opportunities to influence. As the center of concern, the outlook has given this point. Fear of job replacement, lack of critical decision making other than the one program, poor quality of data, the lack of clear strategy. <laughs> and the circle of influence. 
more efficient operation, implementation of real time analytics, improvement of uh, improvement of decision making through availability of data driven insights. All industry needs to keep pace with the innovation of AI and IoT. Well done. Well done. I think he was getting some extra help from the team there as well. I'll take two more. So who wants to share? Okay. Be careful of the... Uh... So uh, as far as the circle of concern is concerned, uh, we start with data acquisition, which means that uh, machine learning needs a lot of massive data. And uh, as, as for it to work properly, I think uh, we need uh, inclusive and unbiased and a lot of good quality of uh, like data required for it to work properly and the next one is interpretation of results the, so that like uh, we need to choose the algorithm required to for the machine learning to work properly if, if you are going for an application you must properly choose an algorithm which suits navigation rather than for something else which is used in the maritime and uh, as far as influence we are going with uh, yeah, easy identifies trends and uh, patterns. Humans can be uh, biased sometimes, but as well as machine learning is in influenced with it, like Amazon e-commerce sites, I think they will learn what we are uh, particularly interested towards and they'll be showing, uh, like as man told it, like, uh, like for example. Yeah, and uh, no human intervention is required. Like most probably once it's already set and once the machine learning has been implemented in a maritime uh, sector, it will automatically improve itself according to the previous set of data given to it with the statistics. And there will be continuous improvements on the maritime sectors, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very well. And, and from the influences, uh, the concept of if we know that the machines are also taking track of what we're doing and what we're buying, we can actually have some control over that. So actually, I don't have any loyalty cards anymore. After that incident, I've decided not to have any more. Who is next? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, our concern is A doesn't have empathy towards human emotions. And uh, the influence we have noted down is uh, A can read and understand people's feeling through text, voice tone, facial expression, and gestures. And uh, by analyzing uh, the data, volumes of data, large volume of data of this uh, text, voice tone, facial expression, and gestures. That's it. I'm holding the microphone so I can't clap, but yes, very well done. So well done, everyone. You have all of yourselves. I'm sorry we're not trying to listen to all of you out there. But Captain Naveen has said he would like to have some comments as well. Since uh, most of them, majority of them spoke about unemployment with AI, I just wanted to add one point on that. Uh, just a question, what do you think came first, theory or practicals? Okay, I think at least in at least in our industry, at least what you are doing, I think the practical came first. So it is the practice which is written as theory and we are just learning the theory so that we can practice it. So it is inevitable that, you know, uh, what this technology of AI and machine learning, big data, it's inevitable, it's coming. So how many of you have done a course, however short it is on any one of this, machine learning, big data, AI, anybody in the class who's done a course, okay, I see one, just, just very few. And this is, this is what the world is looking at. So if you just change your skill set into this, I think there is very hardly any workforce that is currently available to work on this. So just imagine if all of you get skilled in any of these, then you are the most wanted people in the world. So why are we thinking about unemployment?
Uh, that's a very good segue into the next bit that I want to do. I am keeping track of the time, and I do promise we'll have an open mic soon. It might be only 15 minutes worth, though. Um, yes, so how are you educating yourself? Did you know I had this slide next? <laughs> I did tell you I was stuck in traffic for a bit this morning, so I tried to make good use of the time. I'm sure you've seen that. You probably can't see it, but it really got my attention. It says, blockchain, data science, cloud computing, fake data analytics, artificial intelligence, and full stack Python, JS, and Java. So Jason, some of the technologies that are coming. Educate the job. We still need work. We still need navigational experience. We need knowledge. We need all of that. Who's going to program all of this stuff? Who's going to advise on what is required who's going to have the vision to make the tools so the job that i did going to see where i used dividers and parallel rulers loran c time differences that's changed in my time the job that you're looking at right now won't be the same in two years or five years or ten years time it will change so I think one of the best things you can do is to think about how you can position yourself so that you change with it or you influence. Look at that circle. Look at what you can influence. You can influence that change. Yeah, that was pretty good timing. So the maritime professional, our challenge is to how do we address the impact of technology on the role on us, on maritime professionals afloat and ashore? Human-centered, digital society, artificial intelligence. These are all key words. Know what they mean. Know and don't be afraid of them. Think about security, data exchange, digital economies. And all of this is being done within the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We come back to those. Under the UN, they are looking to the future. Those Sustainable Development Goals actually support the work that's happening here with all of the work that we're doing. And this came out of the G20 back in 2019. So it's not new. That's three years old, but it's not new. And that says, well then, what is a maritime professional? It's changing. What is our role? Who are we? And what will be a maritime professional in the future? I don't know. Um, so we've got Maritime professionals who are STCW trained. We've got maritime professionals who are yacht masters. Maritime professionals who are BTS operators, people in the authorities, shipping, crew, management, agents, and a really cool website. If I can get to it quickly, let me see if I can get there. There's a website that's been set up by the UK. I can get it dragged over. Let me get it there. And it's a careers map website. It was done a few years ago. I'm just going to have to manipulate it with two hands, and I can't do all at once because my brain is not yet wired into my computer. One day. So you won't be able to hear me while I play with it. But this is a cool little site. And you can walk your way around it. If I can make my mouse to work. Yeah, get it working. You can find your way around this website, except my mouse isn't working. Here we go. So you can look at all the different roles that you might have at sea. And, and this is being updated, ideally, by UK Maritime. Think of all the things you could do. Where you can fit. So you guys, you guys are there, some of you. And then you can take a look at how all the different roles play in. And some of the changes that are happening. So maritime business services, where you might go to as business degrees. Think about where you can work in shore and other roles. That'd be great if I could. Could you, well, I can actually, yeah, maybe I can do it. Yes, thank you, you can hear me, sorry. So think of what you can do with your role. So if you get your, when you get your degrees, 
where do you want to go? You might have a vision that there's only one role for you. But there are many, many, many roles in the industry. And if you take a look at this little website, I've given it to you, the link. You can explore those roles at sea and ashore, different levels of roles. Now, these careers at sea and beyond is a great place to go for inspiration. But this, of course, is based on what's there now. So you have the opportunity to be entrepreneurs, to be visionary, to have that, you know, that dream concept of innovation. I really love that. Industry 5.0 is what can you dream of? Because you can probably make it work. And so that's just a little site I wanted to visit with you. And it all comes down to changing skill sets. So we have to think about how can we optimize our well-being, our skill sets for our future. Because it is your future, not my future, it's your future. Five, ten years from now, the industry will look very different than it does today. The industry looks different today than it did five years ago. So how can you position yourself to be there? It's these skill sets. When it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence, knowing your digital rights, having digital literacy, digital communications, digital emotional intelligence. And that's basically just being understanding what digital can do for you. Digital security, being safe in the digital environment, using digital equipment and having a digital identity. So this actually has come out of the OECD for schools. Well, you're a school, right? So the OECD has done a lot of work on this. This is actually also being promoted at the lower levels because about even, even back in about 30 years ago, I could train for a job and know it was going to be there for the next 20 years. Now, kids who are in high school, kids who are in grade five, six, seven, they will do roles that don't even exist yet. Their jobs will be something that we don't even know about yet because we are changing so quickly. So the only way to be adaptable and to do those influence, I love that influence, to influence for change, is to take control of your own training and your own skill set. So we need to equip maritime professionals for the digital age. Collective awareness, sharing your knowledge, keeping the network going. Upgrade your skill sets right now. Think about what the opportunities are to learn and what information you can get. And do continuous learning. So don't forget, when you finish and you get your degree, I think I said this before, be really excited, party a bit, have a dance, throw your hat in the air. And then the next day, go back to school in some manner because you're going to continually learn. It will never stop. And that is why we humans have an up as well because we have that lateral thinking, we have that vision, and we want to work with our analog thinking, humans and machines working together, trying to avoid the conflict and work collaboratively because that's what we can do. But that's where we're going. Now, what is one thing you can do? Let me just get here in a second. Let me get up my mentee. Yes. A little bit different as mentee. Actually, let's just use this mentee because I'm not sure I upgraded that one. Let me just get here. I want you to go to mentee.com. I'm not sure that the updated QR code is correct. Where's my mouse? My mouse has disappeared. Where's my mouse? Oh, there it is. I see it. I see it. Okay. So, on your phones, somebody's there already. On your phones, go to menti.com. Type in the code at the top of the screen. So, on your phones, go to menti.com and type in the code at the top of the screen. How can we prepare maritime professionals for the digital future? I've, I've given you some options. You have to choose your top three. 
And I'll wait till they start coming in a bit. I'll get some good ones coming in. This is great. I love seeing it come. I do enjoy these tools. Okay, right now we're pretty even on focus training on critical thinking and focus training on digital intelligence. They're both pretty big. Uh, resilient human machine systems is big up there too. We've got psychologically and physical safe environments are both there along with address the digital divide. Um, so the digital divide is, is real, ships and shore. I can see that there's going to be a lot of new innovation coming out of this class. You've got some great ideas and I like that developing that resilient human machine. How can we do that? Excellent. Slow down a bit. We're up to 70 something coming in. How many are in there right now? 80? Okay, that's pretty good. Up to 80. I think it's probably almost everybody. Okay, let's take a look at what we got. We've got focusing the training on digital intelligence and then closely followed by critical thinking and developing resilient human machine systems. And pretty much there at a tie with the digital divide, physically and psychologically safe work environments. And a couple of others. I put that there because I know I can't think of them all. That's why I put other in there. Okay, that's excellent guys. Let's go and move to that's excellent people. I have to watch my own terminology. There's my mouse again. There it is. I hope everyone's done because I'm about to move the slide. Is someone still going in? Okay. I want to get everybody's input, but I'm about to move to the other slide. Okay. I'm moving to the other slide now. This is a fun one. This is a word cloud. What are the challenges to learning and working in a digital world? You can have fun with this one. What are the challenges to learning and working in a digital world? <laughs> I like seeing the emojis come up. Thank you. I was about to say, make sure you put an emoji up there. This is so much fun. I was looking at the ones from yesterday last night. They were making me smile. <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very true. A challenge to working in the digital world is sleep. We have so much digital world going on. When I was president of Nautical City, I lived in Australia. A lot of people in Europe. Europe's awake when Australia's asleep. They expected me to be awake when they were awake. And then I had to be awake when I was awake. So when was asleep? <laughs> it's a good one. Lack of support. Yeah. That's a good one. Laziness is interesting because when the machines do so much for us, are we going to become lazy? Are we going to become complacent and not do things? So that's that's a real concern. Complacency. Fear of data. Yeah. Oh, thank you for putting the Australian flag up there. Whoever did that. Woo! Right on. I don't see the Canadian flag up there, though. Okay, that's a challenge. Find the Canadian flag for me. <laughs> okay, knowledge, fear of data, privacy really are still the big ones. Yeah, pretty cool. It's coming in really quickly again. Now, knowledge. Ah, oh, I found the Canadian flag. Thank you. I'm very happy. Oh, and the Indian, too. We're cross cultural. International. Okay, a couple more here I want to see. 
see. Placement. Yes. Fear of jobs. Job loss. Don't think of it as job loss. Think of it as job opportunity. It'll be different than what you think it will be. But gosh, I don't know what it will be. What else is up there? It's going so quick, it's hard to read. Lack of resources. Okay. Lack of knowledge, lack of resources. And the haves and the have-nots in a digital world. Big concern. Oh, this is so cool. Mindset. Ooh. I love that one. Mindset. It is all in our minds. Do we have a positive outlook? That's great. If we have a negative outlook, well, it will be bad. So keep your mindset. Okay. I'll let it go for a few minutes, but I am going to move into the open mic session because we're going to run out of time. Ten minutes for open mic. I knew you have one. You never... Uh, ma'am, a uh, very normal question this time, I guess. I hope. So, uh, all right. Uh, the thing is, ma'am, uh, we all fear AI because, again, uh, as my friend mentioned here, yeah, privacy. A lot of our data is out there. And we know US is that one country which is all the information of our online data. Now, the thing is, ma'am, in maritime sectors, do you think when it comes to trade, a trade war can be triggered just by US making, like, you know, influencing the decisions of the cargo and the shipment and the tracking. And also, this same data is susceptible to more threat by other countries. Yeah, you always ask the easy questions. The privacy is a huge issue. You're talking to someone who lives in Australia. I don't know if you've seen the news. I, I'm not with Optus, but I am with Medibank Private. So all of my medical information has probably been leaked. So I can't lose sleep over it. Nothing I can do about it, really. Sometimes you have to know what you can do, what you can influence. But yes, privacy is huge. I don't have an answer to that. How do we deal with that? I think the answer is going to have to come from a collective approach to regulation. We do have privacy laws. And adherence to those laws. I mean, we're, we're very good as humans. It's a bit like Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, the pirate law, the pirate code is a bit more like a guideline. We tend to not necessarily follow the regulations. We need to ensure that we are clearly regulated in that industry and that we follow those. But privacy is a real issue. And who's going to hold all the data? Well, right now with LRIT, that was a huge question. Who is going to hold all the data? And how is it going to be audited? So the IMO actually has a database, but nobody can look at it unless you have the right to look at it, and it's audited by IMSO. So there is a structure put in place. But that's one tiny little part of the puzzle. There's so much going on. I'm not sure where the answer is going to come from. People hope that the hash capability in block tag will far exceed the PKI, or the public key infrastructure technologies. It's much easier to implement and use. I think it has to be user-friendly. It has to protect our data, and it has to have that transparency. So it's that trusted system again. I don't have a full answer. Uh, back in uh, 2011, uh, the American government declared that they are tracking us with our activities on our cell phones. So I'm pretty sure, like you know, most of the activities that happen with trade is also being tracked very well. The thing is, now, can the international organizations working give America such high power when it comes to, you know, trade monopoly. Because it's wrong. And at the end of the day, if they can steer the economy, they can even drive third world countries into poverty, which is state-sponsored terrorism again. Yeah, I can't argue with any of that, except for the fact is perhaps maybe you want to go work at the World Trade Organization under the UN. So the UN has these sanctioned bodies, one of which is the WTO. So maybe that's where you need to go. Um, because they, these are big issues, these are concerns. Now, they're tracking me. Does that mean I don't use my phone? No, I'm going to keep using my phone because it's too convenient. I know they're tracking me. I'm not doing anything really wrong, I don't think, I hope, so I shouldn't be worried because they're tracking me. 
But all that data is somewhere, and I'm not sure. Where's all my medical data going on for many day COVID? I don't know. I hope it's okay. Does any of the instructors want to take that one on? No, 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 I'm just saying no. <laughs> <laughs> he always gives me these ones. Um, any other questions? Yes. Uh, my question is about uh, the implementation of blockchain technologies in uh, the maritime industry. Yes, it's been a revolution in uh, maritime industry with the introduction of blockchain technology, uh, which includes the digitalization. From the start of maritime, there were developments that still developments are taking place, yes. But uh, although uh, even after the digitalization of the shipping industry, there are to some extent pollutions and other factors taking place. And yes, till now, the contribution of ship means the ships contribute to around 3% of the world's carbon dioxide emission. My question is, ma'am, uh, with the help of blockchain technology, how can we reduce the pollution at the same time? In, uh, in simultaneously with sustainable development, both should take place at the same time. How can we do that? Thank you. Um, good question. Uh, I'm actually going to divorce blockchain initially from the question. The blockchain is not really all that smart. It's kind of a cool thing, but it is one piece of a puzzle that's much bigger, and it just gives you security. So it is a way to secure your transmissions to ensure that the data that is being shared is secure. Uh, it's it's environmentally friendly when it's not involved in the mining aspect. So the blockchain for Bitcoin includes a lot of data mining, which uses huge amounts of power, which is very bad for the environment on its own right. I think using blockchain within the maritime, and, and it's not, where's Bennett? He's got more on this than I do. I don't think blockchain is being used broadly in the maritime industry right now. It's still just being introduced. Is that right? Yeah, just not yes or no right now because I'm continuing. Yeah, so it's only being used, it's only being introduced. But what I would like to address is the pollution and the greenhouse gas emissions. So ships, yes, they still have that. I don't think blockchain is going to be the answer, but I do believe digitalization can be part of the answer. Machine learning, artificial intelligence can monitor our engines. Are they working efficiently? Are we burning fuel? inappropriately are we steaming at the right speed are we able to provide for alternative fuels in a safe manner looking at the consequences the unintended consequences of using some of these fuels as we've spoken about previously so how can we then address all of these issues in order to minimize our pollution so we've got this plan IMO has a plan they're working towards it COP27 is going on right now I think they have a big meeting link to that coming up we had one on the 9th another one's on the 16th i think in the maritime environment yeah so all we can do is learn and see what's happening now i don't know did you want to talk about blockchain a bit more in a minute or okay oh rather two points uh, he raised the question of security but i think you know that they're working on this private public e Hashing, so that's that's the security of data that is transmitted. So if, if the two traders transmitting, then the third person doesn't get it. You need a private key to open up the data that you send. So there are security measures. Maybe say an there. Yes, you, you, you can and you may not. It take, it, the, the ecosystem needs to give you the permissions. So that's one. Yes, that's a different issue. That's a different issue. Um, coming to, you see, in, in, in one of the ways how blockchain is helping is in shipping, whether it is in ports, logistics, ships, we all work on contracts. So there is a contract between two parties and there are multiple, multiple contracts that, that's there in shipping. But the biggest issue is, for example, just to give a name of a contract, we have a charter party between the charter and the carrier or the ship. So there are lots of terms in the charter party that the ship should meet the speed, you know, it should do this, it should do that. But it's very difficult to keep track. 
So for a charter, they are finding it very difficult to keep track whether the ship is actually following the terms that is written on the paper. So in blockchain, there is something called smart contract. So the smart contract does is automatic check. So the smart contract is a digital contract. So if you are a charter, and you are a ship owner, it's written on a digital contract and the blockchain monitors that digital contract and if you violate anything, he gets a call. So isn't that a better system? Isn't that a better system for him? Excellent, thank you. I have time for one more question. How can we train and prepare officers or crew if there is an advancement in technology every two years? Uh, according to most of yeah, how can we train everybody? There's new technology every two years. Um, good question. I think the concept is that we actually can't be thinking of training on technology. What we need to know is what does the technology do for us? So rather than being trained, for example, Ectus, we got trained on Ectus. But rather than being trained on Ectus, wouldn't it have been better to be trained on what an Ectus should do for us? So that if we get a new version of Ectus, it doesn't matter, we don't need training. We just know how we can manipulate it. So my question is, do you get training on your mobile phones? Can you use it? You can know what to do with it? So why would we expect to be set for training for every piece of new equipment that comes out of the ship? What we need to do is ensure that the equipment is suitable from a human machine interface point of view, it's intuitive, and that we understand what the machine is supposed to do. So our phones, we know what we want it to do. So we need to know what we want the tools to do. So a new tool doesn't mean more training. A new, tra a new tool should just mean a new tool to do what we need to do. And I think that's that's a mindset in the maritime industry. Right now, the mindset in the maritime industry is that you get something new, you go for training. And you need to get a certificate. And you need, right now, still, a paper certificate, although we're working towards those e-certificates. But why don't we just have training on the outcome? Goal-based is what IMO has been working on for a number of years. So we're doing goal-based construction for ships, goal-based approach to maritime autonomous surface ships. Why don't we just do everything goal-based, the outcome, and then we don't need training on everything new. Yes, it will change, and it might even be faster than every two years. But it doesn't mean we need to go for training. It means that we need to have a user interface that's intuitive. We need symbology and icons that are language independent and we as mariners know what the end result is and how we're going to navigate so i think the approach we should take is not training but knowing having that digital intelligence that slide with all of those skill sets that we need having a digital emotional intelligence to understand what a tool should do for ourselves okay i think that's it that means we've come to the end, but I did. I just realized I had one slide I just slid right behind and I didn't get to because it's got some cool things on it. I'm just going to go back one slide before I close out this session. There we go. Because we are breaching the virtual frontier. So I got a lovely picture of a whale to breach for you. Breaching a, a virtual frontier means that we are in this digital transformation. We need to know the inputs and the data. We know that there are tensions. We have this need for innovation, knowledge, and interaction, understanding the strengths of each, and focusing on regulations, technology, and ethics. So we have a lot of power, a lot of influence, a lot of ability to move forward. So thank you very much for your time today. I'm sorry it's an hour, we're cutting it short, but that's it for today.